All right. What did Jesus teach? The gospel miracles happened because Jesus had the spiritual understanding that gave him greater power in prayer than anyone else before or since. We can have that power. It's the spiritual key that unlocks the mystery of the Bible and of the gospels in particular. It is the spiritual key that explains the miracles and shows that they were performed in order to prove to us that we too can perform miracles and thereby overcome sin, sickness, and limitation. This is how we will bring the kingdom of God into the world. Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. I always get these two mixed up. <laughs> this is the Sermon on the Mount by Emmett Fox, a new thought teacher. And if it looks beat up and old, it's because it is. I used to love his teachings and I used to live by them. The parallels are uncanny. <laughs> when Heaven Invades Earth, my next book review. Now, some might be wondering why this book. There's a lot of Bethel books out there. There's a lot of books by Bill Johnson. And this one in particular, I thought that I would read because he did write it a while ago. And it's very popular. This is required reading for BSSM students. So I thought, you know, hey, if I'm going to get into the mind of Bill Johnson. Let's read this book. At first, I actually did want to read two of them. I wanted to read When Heaven Invades Earth and then The Supernatural Power of a Transformed Mind because this is the follow-up book to this book. But then I read it <laughs> and I thought, you know what? There's a lot to unpack in just this one book. I, I don't think I would have been able to put it into two books into one video. So maybe that will be a follow-up to this one. But I have to say, this took a lot of time to do. I spent many hours, dozens and dozens of hours reading this book a few times. I, I like to read it over and over again because that's how I kind of, uh, you know, remember the information I learned by repetition. So the more I go over it, the more I'll remember it. I watched sermons. I asked as many questions as I could from people who actually attend, you know, churches that are like Bethel. I really want to understand this position because I, I don't like straw man arguments. I want to make sure that what I am talking about is a position that somebody else actually holds. Guys, the stuff I'm seeing at Bethel is more like the new thought that I used to be in than what I ever read about in the Bible. And this is kind of why I want to do another video. This is very close to my heart. These teachings that I'm reading about in these books and what I'm seeing about in this, you know, in this church is... It's closer to the beliefs that I left. To believe what this movement teaches, to believe what Bethel teaches, NAR, Signs and Wonders movement, is basically to embrace beliefs that I have abandoned. And what's interesting, guys, is that as a Christian, I actually did believe that Jesus would protect me. A lot of New Agers think this, that you know, whatever they're dabbling with, whatever they're doing, Jesus will protect them because Jesus is good. And I'll probably talk more about this later, in the video, but just because you're a Christian does not mean that you are completely protected from spiritual experiences that you have ventured into against God's will. See, and the funny thing is, guys, is that I used to believe that Jesus would protect me just because I was a Christian. You know, I dabbled with things that I should not have dabbled with. So I don't know if you've watched my Physics of Heaven video, um, but we basically went chapter by chapter and tried to discuss it as we went along. I'm going to attempt to do that same format for this book, go chapter by chapter. Um, I apologize now if this is going to be a long video. <laughs> I, again, I put in a lot of work. I put in many hours into this reading and studying, and I hope that, you know, after I'm done with this video, I'll probably think, man, I forgot to add a few things, but... Uh, such as life, you know, I'm going to do my absolute best to include the information that I think is important to discuss. I also kind of want to share a frustration of mine. I, I share a lot of frustration with people that actually want to sit down with the leaders at Bethel and talk to them about this. It's very difficult to, to read books like this and compare it to the Bible and think, okay, something isn't adding up here. Let's discuss this. Let's talk about this. And Bill Johnson in particular, I'm, I'm going to speak for him because I have read his material. He refuses to, he won't. I think that they're always on the defense though. I think that they are always kind of being attacked. So I just, maybe they don't know friend from foe sometimes, but these things need to be addressed. They, they need to stop their silence. They need to come out and, and speak about these things and address these issues. This is turning into a big deal. I've also seen some insight on maybe why Bill Johnson refuses to talk to critics or people that maybe even have 
simple questions that want clarification on these issues, uh, which we will talk about later in this video. He does kind of talk about this in his book. I'm glad I got out of the New Age when I did, uh, because when I came out of the New Age, I very much would have been attracted to these teachings. I had a yearning for the supernatural, and that's why I loved the New Thought and the New Age. I, I, I wanted to have, you know, more spirituality. And I thought that, you know, through spiritual experience and some sort of spiritual encounter, I could have that. I think it's interesting that a lot of new agers are specifically attracted to Bethel. They can listen to a Bill Johnson sermon and just add Jesus to their beliefs without really ever having to repent of anything. I know people who are new agers who call themselves Christians and can listen to these teachings and kind of live in both worlds. It's just definitely not black and white. Here are a few more things and then we're going to get into it. But first, I really want to say a few things that I think are important. Uh, first, this is not a bloodbath critique. If you want me to, you know, to drag Bill Johnson through the mud and call him names and you know, all these terrible things. This is just not the video for you. That is not my style. Um, I think Bill Johnson is a person too. He has feelings. I would not do this to a Mormon. I would not do this to a Jehovah's Witness. Why would I do this to him? I actually believe there are many saved people at Bethel. They love the Lord. My critique is specific to the leaders at Bethel, specifically Bill Johnson and this specific book. As a leader, he definitely has a responsibility. But I want to present the issues that I'm having, you know, as straightforward and direct as I can, and yet be loving and sincere at the same time. Too many times in the body of Christ, I see people that are just so bitter and, and just ready to attack about anything that Bill Johnson does. Like he can't do anything right. And though I have many issues, I am not going to take it upon myself to be snarky and rude in this critique. I don't think that that glorifies the Lord either. Also, I am not reformed or a cessationist. So understand that my views on this are from someone who loves Jesus, loves the word. I do love Bill Johnson. I have love for the people at Bethel as well. I still believe in the gifts. I absolutely believe that God still does, you know, miracles. But I just think that it's embellished and exaggerated in a very unbiblical way, which we'll get into way more of that into the video. I kind of explained a little bit about this in our cultish interview that we did, but it's almost like a jealous love I have for them. It's like, please listen, please understand what I'm trying to say, you know, that there's something wrong here. Um, also, this book is not as bad as Physics of Heaven. <laughs> uh, Physics of Heaven was a hot mess, absolute, complete mess. I could not handle that book, how new age it was. What I'm seeing in this book, what I've been reading is that there's secondary beliefs, secondary things that I'm seeing Bill Johnson is making an essential. Imagination and experience is looked at as, you know, your perception of truth, not scripture. And above everything else, I was really, really shocked to learn that they have a, what's called a kingdom now theology, which is like dominion theology, which is kind of a little bit of what I started the video out with. It's basically, they literally believe that they need to take over the world in order for Jesus to come back. Everything that's happening with Bethel right now has everything to do with their eschatology. For some people, that would be obvious, but for somebody like me, I'm still learning about this stuff. And for those that may not understand, eschatology is basically what you believe about the end times. It's, it's what you believe maybe your view on Revelation about Jesus returning. Uh, not everybody agrees on that. When I got out of the New Age and the New Thought, there was a lot of things that I kind of put on the shelf and didn't really revisit again. Eschatology was one of them. I used to be a really rapture ready, you know, kind of New Age Christian. I, I was weird. It was a mess. But I had a lot of odd beliefs that mixed Christianity together with my new age. And I used to go to an independent Baptist church. It was King James only, you know, and it was basically their eschatology that they taught was, you know, the church is going to be raptured. The antichrist is going to come. There's going to be tribulation on earth. Some people, lots of Christians still hold to that view. But when I came out of the new age, I just kind of put certain things on the shelf to rediscover on a, on a biblical microscope and never just picked it up again. Eschatology was one of them. And so I, I just, didn't really care much for it until now. Everything that is taught at Bethel has everything to do with revival. The revival must come for Jesus to come back. I will go into more detail on that as well. Um, Bill Johnson kind of reminds me of a revivalist Frankenstein, if you will. Uh, he'll do whatever it takes, even breaking the rules to get his revival, it, whether it's from God or not. Maybe even going as far as saying that he's obsessed with creating this revival which is what he has said he's put on earth to do. You know, like whether it works or not, we're going to, 
we're just going to fake it till we make it. You know, that's kind of what I see is that there's a lot of hype. There's a lot of, you know, stuff going on at Bethel that they need to get it to a certain point. What this reminds me of, uh, kind of a personal story here. A long time ago, my husband got a jet ski. Now this is before we were married. This is a long time ago when, before we had kids, you know, and we had freedom to like do stuff. (laughs) And we went to a lake and he had just bought this jet ski. It was a used jet ski. He goes and he takes it out on the lake. It does not work. It would not work. And this poor guy, my, my poor husband, he tried so hard to believe that it would work. He got on it. It just sunk. And he's like, no, 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 we can do it. We got to do this. We got to do this. We got to do that. Go grab the duct tape, do something to make this work. He could not accept the fact that it was, uh, that he, he bought a lemon and it took a lot of time for him to understand that that was the reality of the situation, that he could not make this work. It's a false reality. Okay. And that's kind of what I see happening at Bethel. This has created a kind of theory I have on why Bethel is venturing into the new age. I will not get into this now, but at the end of this video, I'm going to share some shocking conclusions and things that I've learned in my research and share that at the end of this video. So I'm going to make my case throughout the video. I hope you hang out with me. I, again, have no idea how long this is going to take, but this stuff needs to be talked about and this stuff needs to be said. So onward and forward, chapter one. All right. This one is called The Normal Christian Life. It, there's no way, of course, I cannot read the entire book to you, but I'm just going to read you know, certain parts that concern me throughout the chapters and we'll discuss them. I, I, there's a theme throughout this whole book of not really thinking, of becoming mindless in a weird way way. All right. This is on page 27. Uh, The lack of miracles isn't because it is not in God's will for us. The problem exists between our ears, our mind. As a result, a transformation, a renewing of the mind is needed, and it's only possible through the work of the Holy Spirit that typically comes upon desperate people. Um, He basically begins the book, you know, by saying that we really can't trust our intellect. It's about the power. If I had one word to explain this book, to describe what Bill Johnson is, is trying to express to his readers, that he's trying to, um, you know, display its power. This is a huge theme throughout the rest of the book. Uh, down lower, it says, we will no longer make up excuses for powerlessness because powerlessness is inexcusable. Our mandate is simple. Raise up a generation that can openly display the raw power of God. So this is the theme that he starts the whole book out with. Chapter two is called Commission Restored. This is on page 29, the first page of the chapter. Jesus Christ said of himself, the son can do nothing. In the Greek language, the word nothing has a unique meaning. It means nothing, just like it does in English. He had no supernatural capabilities whatsoever. While he is 100% God, he chose to live with the same limitations that man would face once he was redeemed. He made that point over and over again. Jesus became the model for all who would embrace the invitation to invade the impossible in his name. Now pay attention to this. He performed miracles, wonders, and signs as a man in right relationship to God, not as God. If he performed miracles because he was God, then they would be unattainable for us. But if he did them as a man, I'm responsible to pursue his lifestyle. Recapturing the simple truth changes everything and makes possible a full restoration of the ministry of Jesus in his church. Okay, this is one reason why I would love to sit down and talk to Bill Johnson, because that is a lot like what I just read in the beginning of this video. See, the difference between the new thought Jesus and the Jesus of scripture is that the Jesus of scripture is unique. He was uniquely God to do those miracles. If you take that away from him, he's not unique anymore. He's not any different than a man. And that's what they're trying to say. In the new thought, the whole point is to have a divinity that you also can do exactly what Jesus did, if not more. You want to walk on water? You want to make things appear? You want to control the weather? These are the things that are being taught at Bethel. The, the other thing is 
kind of a weird gaslighting that I'm seeing. What, what I see is that people are asking him questions about this, that they're trying to get clarification. Now you read something like this and out of one side of his mouth, he says this, he says, yes, we can do basically what Jesus did as a man. And then out of the other side of his mouth, he's asked, oh, but do you believe in kenosis? Like, do you believe what you just said? <laughs> basically. And he's like, no, I never said that. You're misunderstanding. That's not what I believe. That's not what I said. So it kind of makes you feel a little crazy. It makes you feel like, what am I, what is happening? You know, it makes you feel confused. It's also interesting to point out that Bill Johnson says that Jesus performed miracles, wonders, and signs as a man in right relationship to God, not as God. This is significant because this implies that if you are in right relationship to God, then you can do the same things that Jesus did. This then begs the question, what does it look like to be in a right relationship with God? The more that we read, the more that you're going to see just exactly how Bill Johnson explains what it means to be in right relationship with God. And just to give you a hint, it has more to do with activating certain spiritual gifts and being anointed and, you know, performing signs, wonders, and miracles than it does actually having to do with the gospel that saves, as we see defined in the word. There's a few more things to read on page 31. Satan didn't come into the Garden of Eden violently and take possession of Adam and Eve. He couldn't. Why? He had no dominion there. Dominion and powers. And since man has, was given the keys of dominion over the planet, the devil would have to get his authority from them. The suggestion to eat the forbidden fruit was simply the devil's effort to get Adam and Eve to agree with him in opposition to God, thus empowering him. Through that agreement, he is enabled to kill, steal, and destroy. It's important to realize that even today, Satan is empowered through man's agreement. Mankind's authority to rule was forfeited when Adam ate the forbidden fruit. Okay, and then on the lower down on the same page, it says, not only was mankind lost to sin, his dominion over planet Earth was also lost. Jesus came to recapture both. Jesus had come to reclaim the authority that man had given away. So we're getting into their eschatology. This is what some would call a kingdom now, kind of a odd dominionistic type of eschatology. Johnson basically wants to create a sort of spiritual utopia. He wants to create that on earth because... The eschatology of Bethel is that the earth has to be at a certain spiritual place, performing in signs, miracles, and wonders before Jesus can return, because the bride needs to be spotless. So in essence, they believe they're taking back dominion of the earth that was taken from them, that was, that was given away by Adam in the garden. And this is why Bethel teaches that we should have full health, wealth, and prosperity now. Jesus needs to come back to a healthy, thriving church, not a poor, sick one. Now, those of you that have even done light Bible reading <laughs> know that there's many issues with this. The world is not getting better. The world is getting worse. And scripture talks about the world getting worse before Jesus comes back. Now, let me explain a little bit of his logic behind this on how he understands this. He basically says if it exists in heaven and the kingdom is here now, then we should literally be able to access those things that are in heaven in the now. We need to access those kingdom blessings and literally bring that kingdom into this reality, into this realm. There's no sickness or poverty there, so there shouldn't be any here. You will constantly see the word dominion repeated in this book. I'm going to give two more examples, read a little bit more about where his mindset is on this. We were born to rule, rule over creation, over darkness, to plunder hell and establish the rule of Jesus wherever we go by preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Kingdom means king's domain. In the original purpose of God, mankind ruled over creation. Now that sin has entered the world, creation has been infected by darkness, namely disease, sickness, afflicting spirits, poverty, natural disasters, demonic influence, etc. Our rule is still over creation, but now it is focused on exposing and undoing the works of the devil. We are to give what we have received to reach that end. And then there is an excerpt down below. The key of David is another part of it. The gospel of salvation is to touch the whole man, spirit, soul, and body. John G. Lake called this a triune salvation. A study on the word evil confirms the intended reach of his redemption. That word is found in Matthew 6, 13. 
deliver us from evil. The word evil represents the entire curse of sin upon man. Poneros, the Greek word for evil, came from the word ponos, meaning pain. And that word came from the root word penis, meaning poor. Look at it. Evil, sin, pain, sickness, and poor poverty. Jesus destroyed the power of sin, sickness, and poverty through his redemptive work on the cross. And Adam and Eve's commission to have subdue the earth, they were without sickness, poverty, and sin. Now that we are restored to his original purpose, should we expect anything less? After all, this is called the better covenant. I honestly didn't realize how much prosperity preaching uh, and teaching Bill Johnson does and has. But the other thing... <laughs> The other thing is his line of logic. So I see this throughout the entire book is that he'll, he'll take one word or one concept and, and kind of mix it together and make a salad and then come out with a, a odd conclusion. Like he's taking words here that, I mean, yeah, like these, these actually do have, a, you know, a, a meaning to them, but to kind of take that and then squeeze it together and say that it means evils, pains, and poor, and, and being poor, and it's talking about sickness and poverty and sin, it's just, his line of logic is, is faulty, you know? I mean, that's how he comes to the conclusion of his teachings. And I actually did do a mini word study on that word, and it, it's not completely what's there. It means to, to toil. It means to work hard. Okay, moving on to chapter three, repentance C. He starts out by saying, most Christians repent enough to get forgiven, but not enough to see the kingdom. On that same page, page 37, it says, repentance means you change your way of thinking. And it's only in changing the way we think that we can discover the focus of Jesus's ministry. Now, how do you think he would end this? What is the focus of Jesus's ministry? It would be the gospel. <laughs> But that's not what Johnson says. The focus of Jesus's ministry is the kingdom. So I, I see this a lot, you know, in, in researching high control groups. It is about the way you think. You have to control the way you think. You don't allow certain thoughts. You don't allow certain people in your life. You don't read certain things because it affects the way you think. Now, if you're thinking this certain way, you're going to believe a certain way, whether it's true or not. Let me read a few more excerpts to kind of discuss a little bit more about this thought of repentance, his definition of repentance. The focus of repentance is to change our way of thinking until the presence of his kingdom fills our consciousness. Down below and a little bit lower, it says, if the kingdom is here and now, then we must acknowledge it's in the invisible realm. Yet being at hand reminds us that it's also within reach. That which is unseen can be realized only through repentance. It was as though, he said, if you don't change the way you perceive things, you'll live your whole life thinking that what you see in the natural is the superior reality. Without changing the way you think, you'll never see the world that is right in front of you. It's my world and it fulfills every dream you've ever had. And I brought it with me. All that he did in life and ministry, he did by drawing from, from that superior reality. So repentance to him is not just, you know, turning from sin, turning towards Jesus. It's, it's literally changing your mindset to a kingdom mindset, a kingdom now theology, a kingdom, the kingdom is in the here and now. Change the way you think, and then you can bring that into your reality. This is why this parallels so much with Emmett Fox, with lots of other new thought teachers. Page 39, it also says this, Paul dealt with this in a letter to the Colossians. There he informs us that God hid our abundant life in Christ. Where is he? seated at the right hand of the Father in heavenly places. Our abundant life is hidden in the kingdom realm, and only faith can make withdrawals. Jesus came to offer the benefits of his world to all who surrender to his rule. This reminds me of a weird Gnosticism. It's like whatever is in the spiritual realm is your actual reality. And then if you control your consciousness, if you, you know, try to fill your mind with these types of thoughts, then you can access that reality. I mean, can you imagine how exhausting that is to be in charge of bringing Jesus back? It seems like God has very little sovereignty in this mindset. And I I'm having a lot of trouble seeing how this is any different than manifesting in Jesus's name. Okay, moving on to chapter four, faith anchored in the unseen. He starts out by saying, faith is the mirror of the heart that reflects the realities of an unseen world the actual substance of his kingdom. Through the prayer of faith, 
we are able to pull the reality of his world into this one. That is the function of faith. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to kind of describe right now uh, how Bill Johnson sees faith. At the beginning, I kind of explained that if I had one word to describe uh, this book, it would be power. And that's basically how they see faith. It's a mechanism that's used to give you power for kingdom miracles, for uh, kingdom realities, things like that. I'm going to read a little bit more and then we'll discuss it. On page 43, chapter four, faith has its anchor in the unseen realm. It lives from the invisible toward the visible. Faith actualizes what it realizes. Below that, it says, many of us have thought that the ability to see into the spiritual realm is more the result of a special gift than an unused potential of everyone. I remind you that Jesus addresses this charge to the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The very fact that they, of all people, were required to see is evidence that everyone has been given this ability. They became blind to his dominion because of their own corrupted hearts and were judged for their unfulfilled potential. Oh, if that's not word for word, certain things that I've read in New Thought books, I don't know what is. <laughs> all right, and then this on page 45, and then I'll say a few things. Seeing the invisible, the invisible realm is superior to the natural. The reality of that invisible world dominates the natural world we live in, both positively and negatively. Because the invisible is superior to the natural, faith is anchored in the unseen. Faith lives within the revealed will of God. When I have misconceptions of who he is and what he is like, my faith is restricted by those misconceptions. For example, if I believe that God allows sickness in order to build character, I'll not have confidence praying in most situations where healing is needed. There's a lot of things to say on that. First, um, throughout scripture, we see an endurance and suffering and hope, not an escape from it. Uh, one example is Romans 5, 1 through 4. It says, therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. Now we'll talk a little bit more about this as you know we get into other subjects, but this is not something that's taught at Bethel. I mean, there are many times throughout scripture that we see that, you know, suffering is made to have some sort of meaning. And I'm not saying that that's every time God does heal, but he does it in his sovereignty, which is something that's kind of devoid in this sense, in this mindset. We're the ones in control in this aspect and in, in, in their frame of mind. On page 46, he's talking about, you know, realists and uh, they're people who believe in more of what is visible than they do in what they can't see. So he goes on to say, you know, about it being a superior reality. There's no tumors in heaven and faith brings that reality into this one. Would Satan like to inflict heaven with cancer? Of course he would, but he has no dominion there. He only has dominion here when and where man has to come into agreement, which is odd because we're not perfect. Uh, we can't have perfection here and now because of sin. On page 47, he's talking about the opposition to revival um, comes from soul-driven Christians, he says. The apostle Paul calls them carnal. They have not learned how to be led by the spirit. Anything that doesn't make sense to their rational mind is automatically in conflict with scripture. See, and this is, uh, I see this throughout the book. He makes little jabs, <laughs> so to speak, at Christians who think, you know, that, that practice critical thinking and, and question things. We go into this more, but that is something that is a, another theme throughout the book. Bible study and thinking are kind of downplayed over spiritual experience. On page 48, he says, faith is the, the mirror of the heart that reflects the realities of this world into ours. It's the substance of the unseen realm. And then a little bit lower, he says, through prayer, we are able to pull that reality into this one. This is how faith functions. His definition of faith is seen more like a force. It reminds me more of new thought and Christian science and Gnosticism and Christianity all packaged together. And he goes on to say, you know, that when faith is embraced, then kingdom principles can be applied to you. So that naturally goes to say that when faith is not embraced, you don't get those kingdom promises. What is faith? Faith is the power that you use to basically 
bring the kingdom into your reality. He says that heaven is moved by faith. Faith is the currency of heaven. He also talks about fearfulness on page 50. Uh, it says fear gives off a similar scent, a scent of decaying meat is what he says. Uh, right before that. Like faith, fear is substance in the spiritual realm. Satan has no power except through our agreement. Fear becomes our heart's response when we come into agreement with his intimidating suggestions. You know, and what, what I, my immediate thought to this was, okay, well, what about people who have no fear and have all the faith in the world yet still don't get their healing? They still don't get their miracle. To me, that's obvious because God is sovereign. He's in control. And I, I mentioned this briefly at the beginning of the video, but I, I think people will, they, they kind of accuse me of being Calvinist when I talk about God's sovereignty. No, this is a biblical teaching. Not everybody that believes that God is sovereign is a Calvinist. So I'm going to reemphasize that. I am not reformed. I'm not Calvinist. I, I do believe that God is sovereign though. He's, he's in control and he does call the shots. So to put us in that type of control, that kind of puts us in God's spot that gives us the control that only he has. On page 52, he says, for the one who has faith, there is nothing impossible. There are no impossibilities when there is faith and there are no exceptions. He's talking about kingdom principles that we have now. So in the kingdom, there's no death, there's no sickness, but why aren't we seeing that? Why aren't people raising from the dead? Why is death even still here then? If we have full access to the kingdom, we should be seeing these things right and left. It's like you do need to not overthink in, in this type of environment. You don't overthink. Um, you kind of have to become a little bit of mindless. I don't mean that as like a jab or anything. You have to become... Uh, to a point where you don't question things. Uh, the issue with this is that it creates a breeding ground for subjective experience though, and subjective teachings. You know, and, and reading on uh, page 55, he's talking about faith that empowers, saying that we all have the power of heaven behind us, but it is our faith that connects what is available to the circumstances at hand. Faith takes what is available and makes it actual. And then later on, they get into the Lord's prayer, you know, about how to release his dominion on earth but he's basically making it out to be that faith is a force a, a force that you can use to get god to do what you want because whatever's in the kingdom should be available to you here and now my issue with that is will you still trust him and love him even if you don't get what you want will you still love him and seek him if you don't get your healing if you don't get your miracle, to some people, that's a deal breaker. One example that I think of right off the top of my head, there was a band named Gunger a while ago. And I, I somewhat remember this story, but basically they went to a signs and wonders church, you know, that emphasized these teachings, you know, that if you have enough faith, God will bring, you know, basically your miracle. They were taught these teachings. They were taught this theology, you know, that God basically has to give you this because it exists in the kingdom. So, you know, you can basically use your faith, your power to make this happen. And the issue was, is that they ended up losing faith. They, I believe they became atheists. If I remember correctly, they, they, they lost their faith in God. And the issue I have is this is lots of people lose their faith. Whenever you're taught that, you know, you, you can access these things. And when you don't get them, you think, what, what is this? Why, why am I even doing this? You know, because people go after the wrong thing. In order to belong into this, in this tribe, you have to conform. And if you have doubts, you're a dangerous person. How many leaders have been built up in these mega churches that fall because the pressure is just too much? And as I look back, we were two kids like trying so hard to get it right. We started trying to get pregnant and we couldn't get pregnant. And people would tell me, just pray and believe, like just say it and it will happen. And I thought, I just don't know how that can be true. My whole perspective on my faith has been a transaction. If I'm good enough or if I pray enough, if I believe enough, then I get blessings and I get a baby or a good life. It's not how life is. We all had this perspective on who was in and who was out. For Michael and I, that began to change slowly. You have to conform, and if you have doubts, you're a dangerous person. I remember looking around going, what am I doing here? What am I building with my life? Our ideas of God are deconstructing, 
what is it that we still believe? But Michael looks at me and just says, I, I, I don't believe in God anymore. Like, I can't believe any of it. And he just ends up like talking more. <laughs> and I, I remember just like freezing in my whole body because there's always been, I was okay with the questions, but I wasn't okay with, with that. When Lucy was born, we had this huge social media blow up. Um, and there's stories in magazines and um, all over the internet about our heresy. And we were completely pushed out of the church world, of this tribe that we really loved, and really painful and devastating it so many times. Jesus is enough. If, if, you, if all you got was him, would that be enough for you? Would you be okay with God telling you no to your miracle? Would you be okay with God telling you no when you're sick? Maybe there's a better reason for it. Maybe there's something that he is using and that's happening that he knows, that he can foresee, that you cannot see, that he's you know, bringing endurance into your life. He's bringing hope. If, if you're taught that there's no hope in your suffering, then whenever suffering does come, you don't have any foundation. You don't have a leg to stand on. You're not taught how to deal with that. You know, and throughout the book, I'm just seeing this really unhealthy emphasis on the kingdom now theology. It's all about their eschatology. Um, it's like Raisin Bran. Um, yes, this, this metaphor will work. <laughs> if miracles and the emphasis on the kingdom were raisins, then when the raisins are picked out from the rest of the cereal and placed aside and were made the focus and the emphasis, then it would seem like it's a lot more than it actually is. But when it's added back into the rest of the cereal, all of a sudden there's perspective. It, it evens itself out and doesn't make itself so dominant. It, it's only part of a whole, you know? And whenever one aspect of scripture is plucked out and emphasized, you know, all of a sudden that becomes the main focus. And you think that that's basically the focus and emphasis of scripture. You tend to think you see this more than what's actually in the totality of scripture. This is what I see false religions and false movements do, is they'll take little, they have a little salad bar belief system of, of the scripture. They just kind of take out and pluck out a scripture, you know, here and there, do their little raisin brown thing and put it aside and make an entire theology out of it. They, they amplify it beyond its meaning. And then what's, what's even more ironic is they'll take that amplified truth from scripture and discard the other teachings of scripture with those emphasized truths. Um, Bill Johnson in this book and what I've seen in his sermons basically emphasize that there are certain parts of scripture that have more authority over other parts of scripture. Some parts are more superior than others. We'll get more into um, how I'm seeing that scripture is de-emphasized later on in this video. On to chapter five, praying heaven down is the name of this chapter. Uh, he starts off by quoting John G. Lake. The church has been negligent in one thing. She has not prayed the power of God out of heaven. Uh, he basically in this chapter talks about the Lord's prayer and breaks it down. Now, let me, let me say one thing. Don't send me letters about this because I'm going to say something nice about Bill Johnson. Um, I like Bill. I actually think that there's things that he as a person can offer uh, that I honestly see other things in the church that are lacking. I would say the same thing about a Jehovah's Witness. Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses have great zeal, but terrible theology. So you, you can take what a Jehovah's Witness does, okay, and think, man, we really need to be more zealous. Man, they, they're not scared to go tell anybody about what they believe. And it's wrong, <laughs> you know? Um, this is one thing that I have always seen from Bill Johnson and from people at Bethel that I actually really admire. I do think that Christians are way too quiet. I think that we need to be talking about what we believe more. I think we do need to have more boldness in what we believe. Now, I also think, however, that whenever you're going to express what you believe, you have to really know scripture. Like you have to actually know what the gospel is. And the gospel is really simple. And I think that a lot of people who do know and understand the gospel don't give it. So all I want to say is that this, this chapter, I'm reading, you know, this book and I see this zeal from, from Bill Johnson. I think he's very sincere. I could probably sit down and have a cup of coffee with him and talk about these things. And, and I would question him a lot, you know, but my point is, is that there are small little things in this book that I actually saw that I agreed with him about, you know, that the fact that people are, are very overly critical to the point where he's just always on the defense, that 
even if people want to talk to him, he can no longer really tell friend from foe. And I think it's because people are constantly attacking him. You can't really tell the difference anymore. So I just kind of want to point that out before we get into chapter five, because this really does get to the meat of a lot of what we're seeing in his theology. So basically, chapter five is about the Lord's Prayer, praying heaven down, literally bringing uh, the kingdom dominion into this earth, onto earth. Uh, They want to claim dominion, and this is done through revival and prayer and signs and wonders and miracles. On page 58, it says the Lord's model prayer provides the clearest instruction on how we bring this, the the reality of his world into this one. The generals of revival speak to us from ages past saying, if you pray, he will come. And then further down, he says, this world is our assignment, but not our home. The resources needed to complete the assignment are unlimited. The only restrictions are those between our ears. Again, you're going to see this theme talking about how our mind can slow us down from kingdom promises. Like that's when I'm really going to need to restrain myself whenever I'm talking about um, his view on scripture and Christians who basically have critical thinking. I also found it interesting on page 59, he says, worship is our number one priority in ministry. God responds with a literal invasion of heaven to earth through the worship of the believer. And I found this interesting. I'm like, why not the great commission? Why isn't the gospel our number one priority. So it just talks about where his mind is at in that sense. And then he continues to break down the Lord's prayer on page 59. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven is the scripture. And he says, this is the primary focus for all prayer. If it exists in heaven, it is to be loosed on earth. It's the praying Christian who loses heaven's expression here. When the believer prays according to the revealed will of God, faith is specific and focused. Faith grabs hold of that reality. Now we see him talk about reality, like the other reality, a lot. Um, Also, I kind of want to point out that, you know, he's talking about, you know, between our ears, our brain, our minds, holding us back basically from kingdom promises. Uh, Scripture is not looked at as the main authority here. It's how you think. It's a lot, again, I'm going to make another parallel to new age. It's it's, your thinking manifests your reality. There's a a theme in this whole chapter about manifesting the kingdom. On page 64, he's talking about Paul in Philippians. He says, Philippians understood very well Paul's charge about being citizens of another world. Paul spoke not about going to heaven someday, but about living as citizens of heaven today, especially from heaven toward earth. We have the privilege of representing heaven in this world so that we might bring a manifestation of heaven to this world. Um, This is, if you read Philippians, that's just not the context in which Paul is talking. He's talking, he literally is talking not about bringing the kingdom here. He's talking about going to heaven uh, apart from the body. The other thing I'm noticing a lot in the book, there's one thing he repeats, uh, exercising authority. So, the other thing that I see a lot and, and, you know, Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, they have their own language almost. It's odd, you know, like you have anointing, you have exercise authority, you have revival, and they're all words that, you know, you say as a Christian, but they have a very different meaning to somebody who's in this movement. You know, for example, Jehovah's Witnesses, it's exercise faith instead of faith. It's a work. You have to work for that faith. You have to do something. And in this case, it's exercising authority. You have to use your authority in order to get your kingdom promises. For example, on page 66, um, on the bottom, there's an excerpt from the perfect storm. It says, even after the disciples got their answer to prayer, a stilled storm, Jesus asked them about their unbelief. For most of us, an answer to prayer is the reward for our great faith. In this case, they got their answer but were said to be small in faith. He expected them to exercise the authority. He had given them to quiet the seas themselves. Instead, they asked him to do it. We often pray in the place of risky obedience. So I'm hoping everybody caught that. (laughs) He's basically saying that the disciples always had the authority to calm the storm, not not just Jesus. So I want to be very careful with how I'm saying these things, but we're not Jesus. This is what makes Jesus unique as God is that he can heal at will and he can control the weather. We can't. These are things that Jesus did that were unique to him as the God man, as him as God. So to take that from him and say, oh, nope, we can do that too. 
not only is a very new thought concept that we can do everything that Jesus did and some that we, that we need to do that, but that we always could have, this takes away everything that makes Jesus God. If we also can do those same things, then what difference is there between us and God himself? That's a major issue I'm having reading this. And again, this, this book is not nearly as bad as physics of heaven. This is a cakewalk compared to physics of heaven. I mean, it's still got some major issues in it, but physics of heaven looked like a coloring book when I was done with it. All right, we're going to move to chapter six, the kingdom and the spirit. Uh, one thing throughout this book and in a lot of books that I see from Bethel are miracle stories about these amazing, fantastic miracles that had happened, uh, healings, signs, wonders, things like that. And it's the Raisin Bran thing again. I, I would like to hear more about, well, what about somebody who didn't receive a healing? You know, if you're taking out of 100 people who say that they need a healing, 10 of them are healed. Those 10 are focused on and the 90 are ignored. And what I would like to see is more, you know, balance in these stories, because if this is all you're looking at, if all you're looking at are the raisins, you really are in that mindset of thinking, oh, yes, this is always happening. This should always be happening, you know? And if you're told basically not to think otherwise, how else can you really know the reality of what's happening? But anyway, let's, <laughs> there's more, more on that later, but Let's get into this chapter. Okay, well, he starts on page 70 about talking about John the Baptist and a, a new standard there. He says on page 70, he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he, talking about John the Baptist. He wasn't saying that the people in heaven were greater than John. There's no purpose for such a statement. He was talking about a realm of living that was soon to become available to every believer. John prophesied of Christ's coming and went so far as to confess his personal need of it. Well, and see, this is the thing, and this is why Bible reading is so important. He's talking about people that were born of the spirit. He who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he, is greater than John the Baptist, because John the Baptist is the greatest out of those born of women of the flesh. But he's still not greater than somebody born of the spirit. The one born of the spirit is still greater than the one born of the flesh, no matter how amazing they are. Further down on page 70, he's talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It is the baptism in the Holy Spirit that became God's goal for mankind. Now, again, I want to point out that he's emphasizing these secondary issues and making them essentials. This was the goal of God to give us the baptism of the Holy Spirit, not, not the gospel. You know, so there's, there's an element of priority there that is just different than what I see in scripture. The baptism in the Holy Spirit makes a lifestyle available to us in which not even John had access. That doesn't really make complete sense to me because Old Testament prophets did way more cooler miracles than we ever see at Bethel. And on page 71, he says, salvation was not the ultimate goal of Christ's coming. Let me just pause there for a second. Salvation was not the ultimate goal of Christ's coming. Really? It was the immediate target, the marker in the lane. Without accomplishing redemption, there was no hope for the ultimate goal, which was to fill each born-again person with the Holy Spirit. God's desire is for the believer to overflow with himself that we might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now, I want you to notice something. Be filled with all the fullness of God. He's quoting a scripture there. He's quoting Ephesians 3.19, and it's just the last part of it. This is how doctrine is created in these movements. You, you take a little bit of scripture and you piece it together. To say that salvation is not the ultimate goal of Christ's coming kind of breaks my heart a little bit. If the goal of Christ's coming was to give us the baptism of the spirit, that makes the cross a little empty. And the chapter goes on. He's talking more about how to get, you know, God's dominion into this world. On page 73, it says, those who learn how to work with the Holy Spirit actually cause the reality of this world, his dominion, to collide with the powers of darkness that have influence over a person or situation. The greater the manifestation of his presence, the quicker the victory. Page 74, God doesn't have to try to do supernatural things. He is supernatural. If he is invited to a situation, we should expect nothing but supernatural invasion. That puts the power on our hands, not, not God. If he's invited, if he is invited, 
we open that door according to this. Now, something that I've seen throughout, you know, Bethel books that I've read, sermons, everything, is the disdain for scripture, which is ironic because they quote scripture and then, you know, seem to have this disdain for it at the same time. On page 76, he says, while he never contradicts his word, he is very comfortable contradicting our understanding of it. Those who feel safe because of their intellectual grasp of scriptures enjoy a false sense of security. None of us has a full grasp of scripture, but we all have the Holy Spirit. He is our common denominator who will always lead us into truth. But to follow him, we must be willing to follow off the map, go beyond what we know. Further down, he says, the church has all too often lived according to an intellectual approach to the scriptures, void of the Holy Spirit's influence. I don't think I agree with that. I'm going to go into a lot more detail later on in this video about this because I, you guys know how I am about reading your Bible. <laughs> it's incredibly important to read and understand scripture. There are secondary things that we will not always agree on, but scripture is very clear and, and easy to understand in this aspect. His interpretive method is basically this. He calls the clarity and simplicity of scripture into question and elevates personal experience and feelings above God's word. This basically, in essence, makes God unknown uh, without some sort of mystical, supernatural encounter or experience. What is interesting to me is that in all my research, at this point, uh, Bill Johnson's view of the Holy Spirit <laughs> points more towards signs, wonders, power, and experience instead of towards repentance, Jesus, and scripture, which again, I will get into more later because there's a lot to say on that. And if I get into it now, I'm going to, the entire video will be me talking about how I disagree with this. <laughs> okay. We're on to chapter seven, the anointing and the antichrist spirit. Uh, this is an interesting chapter. It starts off on page 79 right away. I'm just, why do you make me do this, Bill Johnson? I remember putting the book down and, and putting it down flat at some point, thinking, just realizing what I'm reading and having moments of understanding and clarity of just where he stands in his beliefs, which is my goal, by the way. It, it is my goal to really understand what he believes. And I can't just ask him for clarification. So I, I read his books. I listen to his sermons. And this chapter was kind of a turning point for why I came to certain conclusions that I'll explain at the end of this video. Okay, chapter seven, page 79 at the bottom, it says the anointing Jesus received was the equipment necessary given by the father to make it possible for him to live beyond human limitations. For he was not only to redeem man, he was to reveal the father. In doing so, he was to unveil the Father's realm called heaven. That would include doing supernatural things. Now, now listen to this. The anointing is what linked Jesus, the man, to the divine, enabling him to destroy the works of the devil. These miraculous ways helped to set something in motion that mankind could inherit once we were redeemed. Heaven, that supernatural realm, was to become mankind's daily bread not Jesus, not just Jesus, just Jesus is boring. It's the supernatural that's your daily bread. It's the encounters. It's those visions. It's those prophecies. It's the stuff that you feel and that experience. That, that's what you need every day to, to be spiritually fulfilled. Jesus, he's not enough. That's what I'm reading right now. Uh, the chapter goes on. Uh, basically, a theme for this chapter is uh, where Johnson is discussing how people who love theology, like me, and Bible study, can possess what he calls an antichrist spirit. And we're basically fear-oriented. <laughs> I'll probably have a lot to say um, about this chapter. <laughs> I just don't know when obeying scripture became legalistic. I, I, I will never understand this, how reading scripture and studying it somehow makes us a Pharisee. I, I, but again, I'm restraining myself. I will, we will come to a point where that will be the subject at hand, but right now I'm moving on. So something in this chapter that he talks about a lot, again, it's another uh, hyper charismatic buzzword is the anointing. So like faith to them is basically a powerful force to bring, you know, a sense of dominion here on earth, signs, wonders, miracles, healing, 
anointing has a different definition as well. On page 80, it says it's under qualifying anointing. If the son of God was that reliant upon the anointing, his behavior should clarify our need for the Holy Spirit's presence upon us to do what the father has assigned. Anointing brings supernatural results. Here's my issue with this. Jesus is God. He had human limitations, but this didn't limit his anointing. We're not Jesus. He goes on to say, you know, how the anointing is, you know, against the enemy, that hell hates the anointing because the anointing is, you know, a breakthrough to bring God's dominion here to push Satan out saying, this is not your dominion. This is not your domain, Satan. You need to, you know, we're going to take possession of this. We're going to take power. And it's through the anointing and faith, remember their definitions, that they can make that a kingdom reality. The anointing is actually the person of the Holy Spirit upon someone to equip them for supernatural endeavors. So if somebody is highly anointed, that basically means that they have a lot of supernatural experiences. So here's where it kind of takes a twist on the next page. The spirit of the Antichrist is at work today, attempting to influence believers to reject everything that has to do with the Holy Spirit's anointing. This rejection takes on many religious forms, but basically it boils down to this. We reject what we can't control. That spirit has worked to reduce the gospel to a mere intellectual message rather than a supernatural God encounter. And then go down a little bit more on the next paragraph. It is the Antichrist spirit that has given rise to religious spirits. A religious spirit is a demonic presence that works to get us to substitute being led by our intellect instead of the spirit of God. Being led by the Holy Spirit is an ongoing God encounter. Religion idolizes concepts and avoids personal experience. I mean, no. <laughs> I mean, we, we have to come to the Bible and Bible study, Bible reading, everything with both spiritual and academic intents. It's a spiritual book, but it's to be understood with your mind. And I have a lot to say about scripture, talking about our minds, about studying the scriptures, about using our mind and our intellect to, you know, make certain judgment calls of the spiritual. But it also talks about, you know, people who really are religious and legalistic, who really are staunchy in their walk. You know, I understand that aspect, but what he's talking about and very talks about this throughout the entire book on the pulpit at his church and other books is that whenever you basically are approaching scripture to study it, to really understand it, that cannot supersede your experience. They call it, they, they say that God will draw outside the lines that we can't put him in lines, but there's, there's more to this. I think that what he's doing is that he's taking the small little minority of people who really are very, um, they might have, you know, a lot of legalistic, you know, viewpoints, but to basically say that people that enjoy Bible study and, and really strive to understand the Bible first, and that takes priority over experience does not mean that I have an antichrist spirit. It means that I, I look at scripture like it's authoritative over my experience. You know, and with experience, I mean, sometimes it's not God at all. Sometimes it's our subjective experiences that make us think that it's from God. I mean, I mean, think about this for a second. If you take away the one thing that people use for discernment, the one thing that people need to tell the difference between a, a a true experience with God and a false experience with God, the word, the Bible, and demote it to a simple aid instead of a foundation for truth, uh, then you can believe whatever you want. This creates a subjective God that's inconsistent. I actually have an example on this. This happened not too long ago. I have a friend who is basically a new thought Christian. They believe in miracles. They believe in, you know, works of God, but they also are very much into, you know, manifesting law of attraction, things like that. And they believe it's in the Bible, by the way. They think that this is a biblical view. They were at my house. We walk outside and I'm walking her to her car. And as we're walking to her car, I see that her car, which is brand new, it's covered with water. Water drops are all over this car. And I'm like, it did not rain. And we live in a desert, so nobody has grass in their lawns. <laughs> like, it's not like the sprinklers came on or something. There, we have rocks in our driveway. I mean, we don't, 
there's no source for this water to have come from except the sky. And immediately my friend thinks that this is a miracle. She immediately thinks that this is a sign from God. She's like, oh my goodness, things like this happen to me all the time, you know? And there was no research. There was no thinking, what's, is there a logical explanation for this? And I mean, we looked around the car, everything was bone dry, but then I looked closer. Now she's going on and on about how cool this is. You know, it's amazing that God does stuff like this and that who knows why. And it, it's really outside the lines, the things that he does. And, you know, this is just him, you know, giving her a sign. This is him speaking to her somehow. What does it mean? She's over here trying to figure this out. <laughs> and I'm over here thinking, hold on a second. I look over at my rose bushes and I'm like, oh wait, there's water on my rose bushes. And then I go and I look at my car next to hers because at first I thought there was no water anywhere. And I look closer at my car and I'm like, no, 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 there's water on my car. And then I look at the tires and I see that it's wet. I'm like, it rained. It had to have rained. And the reason why it beat it up on her cars was because it was a brand new car. Well, I told her this and she's like, oh, oh, okay. I see. Oh, I see that. Oh, okay. I see there's water there now you know, and she had to kind of backpedal a little bit. My point is, is that a lot of times without that critical analysis that I'm demonized for, by the way, we see what we want to see without investigating because so many in this movement are taught not to critically think, but instead are told to put their intellect aside and God communicates in crazy, fantastic ways. You know, just put that intellect aside, lest you grieve or quench the Holy Spirit or, you know, even be accused of having a religious spirit, or in this case, the Antichrist spirit. I have a few more things to say on this chapter. Thanks for hanging with me, guys. On page 83, while few would admit it, the attitude of the church in recent days has been, if I'm uncomfortable with something, it must not be from God. This attitude has given rise to many self-appointed watchdogs who poison the church with their own fears. Hunger for God then gives way to fear of deception. What do I trust most, my ability to be deceived or his ability to keep me? And why do you think he gave us the comforter? He always knew his ways would make us uncomfortable. See, they sacrifice discernment on the altar of experience here. It's like, as I explained in the beginning of this video, I called myself a Christian. I, I went to church every week for like a decade. <laughs> I still ventured into spiritual stuff that I shouldn't have ventured into. I did things I shouldn't have done. And I willfully went into those things. The thing is, is that you can't ask God to protect you from something he says to avoid. If you're going into, you know, new age practices, you're going to do a tarot card reading or, you know, even talk about channeling angels or, or, or invoking them in some way or whatever it is. He says not to do it. Um, there will be times that he's going to hand you over to that. It's willful sin. Further down on that same page, he's talking about um, balance. <laughs> Such fears cause believers to become polarized. Fear separates and alienates. This is the picture that many paint. In one corner, we have balanced looking people who value the Bible as the word of God. And in the other, we have emotionally unbalanced people who seek after esoteric spiritual experiences with God. Is that an accurate biblical picture? Jesus made a frightening statement regarding those who hold to Bible study versus experience. You search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life. And these are they which testify of me. I always found this really weird that they use this scripture, again, to demote scripture. It's the strangest thing. What I see is I see Bill Johnson here using this scripture to back up what he's saying that people go to the scripture, they read their Bible too much, and they think that that's gonna give them eternal life when that's just not what this verse is saying. What I think Bill Johnson is neglecting, again, is the context in which the Pharisees are being addressed. If our study of the Bible doesn't lead us to a deeper relationship and encounter with God, then it simply is adding towards spiritual pride. We increase our knowledge of the Bible to feel good about our standing with God and to better equip us to argue with those who disagree with us. 
any group wanting to defend a doctrine is prone to this temptation without a God encounter. It's ironic to me how much he demotes scripture. I want you all to, to see this. When, this, when scripture is demoted from authority, that's when you get some really weird theology. This is the pattern I'm seeing. And it's really ironic to me. This is, this is what I see a lot of people in this movement saying. They say it's Father, Son, Holy Spirit, not Father, Son, Holy Bible. And the first time I heard that, it actually did make me think a little bit. I'm like, oh, well, that's kind of true. But then I thought about it even more. I used my critical thinking. And I'm like, but the Holy Spirit wrote the Bible. <laughs> if the Holy Spirit gave us the Bible, he said, write this down. This is authoritative. This is foundational for your spiritual Christian walk. And, and that, that's obeyed. Then the scriptures are written by the very spirit of God. They're written by the very spirit they claim to hear from. So you can't have this experience contradict this word because and say it's both from the Holy Spirit. I mean, not to be redundant, but scripture is God-breathed, the only authoritative scripture we have given by the Holy Spirit. And it's the Holy Spirit that demands it to be our foundation. So here's, here's my question. What spirit is telling Bill Johnson not to give it the authority it demands? And there's more. He says a lot more on this um, on page 84. Jesus did not say, my sheep will know my book. It is his voice that we are to know. Why the distinction? Because anyone can know the Bible as a book. The devil himself knows and quotes the scriptures. But only those whose lives are dependent on the person of the Holy Spirit will consistently recognize his voice. This is not to say that the Bible has little or no importance. Quite the opposite is true. The Bible is the word of God, and his voice will always be confirmed by scripture. That voice gives impact to what is in print. See, this is what I call speaking out of both sides of your mouth. And this is why I call this gaslighting, because it's like, I don't know if he's trying to cover his tracks or what, but it's like, you just diss scripture, and then out of the other side of your mouth, you're elevating it. Like, which is it? It's almost like he's saying, oh, oh, but hold on, I'm not saying this. Let, let me, you know, let me just make sure that we understand what's happening here. It's very confusing to know where he stands on this. I personally a hundred percent think that he elevates. I mean, it's throughout this entire book and throughout his, all his teachings. Don't put God in a box, whatever it is. It's very obvious that experience trumps scripture. Still on page 84, as the Holy Spirit rece receives back the reins over his people, he works to reset a more biblical parameter for the Christian life. This frightening change is for the better. We can and must know the God of the Bible by experience but experience is subjective. And then he goes on to the Antichrist spirit and the goal of the Antichrist spirit. The Antichrist spirit has a goal for the church. Embrace Jesus apart from the anointing. In other words, it's not Jesus alone. Jesus is not enough. You have to have the anointing. You have to have the anointing to have the full presence of God, to have the full gospel, which yes, Bill Johnson talks about having a gospel of signs and wonders. We'll get into that later. Without the anointing, he becomes a safe religious figure who is sure not to challenge or offend us. Paul described this deceptive possibility as having a form of godliness, but a denying its power and from such people turn away. What I don't like about this is that a clear reading of this verse, which he's quoting at 2 Timothy 3.15, it's talking about unbelievers, you know, people who say that they believe in Jesus, uh, but don't follow him. So I don't agree with this at all. I mean, if you read second Timothy, that's what it's saying. It's not talking about believers. Another parallel to make is that, you know, the new age says that you need to basically become kind of mindless because if you think too much, you're going to hinder your spiritual experience. And then with false religions, I, I've studied LDS, Mormonism, high controlled religious groups, uh, Catholicism even. If you want to make up your own religion, your own belief system, make sure the first rule is to take away the authority of scripture and then add to it. It's never the Bible alone. It's the Bible plus. It's Jesus plus. Jesus plus the anointing. Jesus plus signs and wonders. That's the actual gospel. The Bible plus. It's the Bible plus experience. So 
that's kind of where I'm seeing this ball rolling right now. The bottom of page 85, he says he refuses to be restricted by our understanding of his word. <laughs> Do you see what I mean by talking out of both sides of his mouth? God refuses to be restricted by the Bible. Every way I've ever advised anybody to use discernment is by having the Bible as your foundation. He's telling you to do the opposite, okay? Uh, experience is your barometer of truth. Again, I, I know I, I don't want to sound redundant, but I do want to emphasize, I believe in miracles. I believe in healings. I 100% believe that God does still do this, these things. But I do think that he is in control of this, that there's a will and a reason for it. If, if you don't always get your miracle, again, it has to always come back to Jesus as your foundation about him being the sustainer of your faith, of your hope, of your whole walk, not your healing. But moving on to chapter eight, you guys thought I had a lot to say about chapter seven. Just wait. Okay, we're going to start on page 87, chapter 8, Teaching Into and Encounters, the name of the chapter. The whole chapter starts out by saying, any revelation from God's word that does not lead us into an encounter with God only serves to make us more religious. Uh, further down the same page, he says, Nicodemus said to Jesus, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless it, God is with him. It was understood that God's kind of teachers don't just talk, they do. And the doing that is referred to in John's gospel is the performing of signs and wonders. And then I'll read a few more things that he says, and then I'll give some thoughts. Page 89, we value concepts and ideas above experience with results. I wish that pertained only to secular schools, but the culture which values ideas above experience has shaped most of our Bible schools, seminaries, and denominations. Many present day movements have made a virtue out of staying the course without a God experience. To make matters worse, those who speak subjectively of an experience are often considered suspect and even dangerous. But God cannot be known apart from experience. Further down on the page, same page, God has promised to back up our message with power if our message is the gospel of his kingdom. Same page. The problems we face today are not new. The apostle Paul had great concern for the Corinthian church, for they were being enticed by a gospel without power. Okay, a few things. First, the Corinthians were abusing the gifts. Here, uh, Bill Johnson is quoting 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians is one of my favorite books in the New Testament, First and Second Corinthians. And what Bill Johnson is basically trying to say is that the Corinthians were around teachers that were teaching them a gospel that didn't display signs, wonders, and miracles, which I actually find very ironic, especially considering that the Corinthians were being rebuked by Paul. The whole reason why Paul wrote this letter to the Corinthians in the first place was to attempt restoration in the Corinthian church to its original foundation, which would have been in Jesus Christ. The spiritual gifts were being used improperly. There were many misunderstandings of essential Christian doctrines, and Paul was trying to correct that. So for Bill Johnson to quote this scripture in defense of preaching a gospel of power, I find very ironic. I find it to be a misuse of scripture and how to interpret it correctly within its context. If anything, Bill Johnson and the leaders at Bethel can learn a lot from this letter from Paul. I'm going to read a few more things on page 92. In this, this whole section is called God is bigger than his book. Um, he quotes a scripture. You are wrong because you know neither the scriptures nor God's power. The word no in this passage speaks of personal experience. They tried to learn apart from such an experience. They were the champions of those who spent time studying God's word, but their study didn't lead them into an encounter with God. It became an end in itself. An encounter with God is often a power encounter. Such encounters vary from person to person according to God's design. And it's the lack of power encounters that lead to misunderstanding of God and his word. Experience is necessary in building a true knowledge of the word. Further down, it says the Bible is the absolute word of God. It reveals God, the obvious, the unexplainable, the mysterious, and sometimes offensive. 
It all reveals the greatness of our God, yet it does not contain him. God is bigger than his book. I mean, you guys, <sighs> there's more, there's a little bit more on this chapter, but let me just stop here and give some thoughts. This really is becoming more and more of what I do see in LDS and Jehovah's Witness, Catholic, and other religious leaders. They dislodge the sufficiency of scripture to make way for their own beliefs. But they also say that they see the Bible as the word of God. Hey, we preach the gospel. We preach salvation. We preach, you know, repentance. We believe the Bible. They're the same terms, but they have totally different definitions. The thing is, is that they must do this in order for their teachings to make sense. The irony is that the Bible is kryptonite to their teachings. Get scripture out of the way, you know, their only tool for discernment, then you can believe what scripture does not allow and yet still call it Christian because you say it's still from the Bible. Guys, let me tell you this. Let me give you a warning right now. If you ever see anybody dismiss or downplay or disregard or make it feel like you're doing something wrong if you're studying your Bible, then you, you very much need to be doing just that. That's a sign that that's exactly what you need to be doing. Because how else would you know how Jesus and the Spirit function if not displayed how it is in Scripture? If you're kept away from that as a foundation, then you don't know any better. The, the interesting thing is that with all these religions, ironically, it is the study of scripture that has crashed their beliefs, like in a good way. It's, it's coming to the scriptures and reading them and studying them that they open their eyes and they're like, oh, that's why they didn't really want me to read that. My email is full of people messaging me, telling me just this, that it was the diligent study of the Bible that brought them out of these false belief systems. I find it no coincidence that with my study of false religions and false movements, there's always the same parallels. They're executed differently, but this is what I see. You always have leaders that are anointed somehow. Somehow they're closer to God. You know, with Jehovah's Witnesses, you have the governing body. You have the Pope. You have, you know, the Mormons have their prophet. I mean, there's lots of other religions, but I'm using these three because people are very familiar with these religions and how they work and function. They're looked at as spiritual fathers. They're closer to God somehow. They're their leaders and they are respected in that religious movement, that religious group. They always dismiss the authority of scripture. It's always about your experience. LDS are huge about this. Mormons will tell you they believe what they believe because the Holy Spirit bore witness that the Mormon church is the true church. How else in the world would you ever convince a Mormon that that was wrong? <laughs> Um, by the scriptures, you would, you would read the scriptures and clearly see that there's a huge disconnect there. They demote scripture and elevate something else in its place, Wh whether it's other things that are written by these anointed men and women. Uh, there's other writings that are written sometimes that can be seen from coming from God that are looked at as basically being on par. Maybe they help explain the scriptures with the Jehovah's Witnesses. That's the case. You know, they have their Watchtower magazine. You know, that you have a, the Book of Mormon. You have the Catechism. This really muddles things. A another thing that they can do is just write your own Bible. <laughs> Create your own version of the Bible. Now, some of you might think, oh, but Bethel hasn't done that. Yes, they have. And it's called the Passion Translation. The Passion Translation was created by one man, Brian Simmons. Brian Simmons claims that Jesus came to him and endorsed him for this project to write this Bible, that he was going to be given secrets of the Hebrew language to write the Passion Translation. With Jehovah's Witnesses, they made their own Bible to fit their theology. Uh, LDS, Mormons, they have their Book of Mormon, but they also have a Joseph Smith translation that Joseph Smith claims he um, had divine revelation to write. We see this a lot. People change the Bible to fit their theology. If you don't like what the Bible says, just rewrite it. And that's basically what the Passion Translation does. Now, I have read parts of the Passion Translation, and maybe someday this will be another video. I don't know because it's a lot of work uh, to break down a Bible compared to a book. <laughs> but you guys, the Passion Translation, it's heartbreaking to see how it just changes the theology, the 
the simplicity of the word and it again exemplifies it it elevates experience super the supernatural in scripture that's never there but according to brian simmons yeah it is because jesus himself came and told him this do you see the issue here i will give more information on brian simmons later on in my conclusion um, I also am going to have links in the description of this video with certain things pertaining to the topics that I'm going over. So the other thing I also see that um, I see a lot of this in Bethel and I see a lot of this in uh, certain other churches, you know, Word of Faith, is that the Bible's looked at more as a uh, self-help book, an aid, than it is uh, your, your authority, as it is then, you know, the foundation of your theology. The next page, page 94. Revelation that doesn't lead to a God encounter only serves to make me more religious. Knowledge puffs up. And here he's quoting 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1, which I love 1 Corinthians chapter 8. It's one of my favorite chapters. So I will say something about that. He says, knowledge puffs up. Notice Paul didn't say unbiblical knowledge or carnal knowledge. Knowledge, including that which comes from scripture has the potential to make me proud. Now, here's the thing. Um, I'm gonna give Bill Johnson some grace with that sentence. I'm gonna do this two ways. First, I'm gonna give him grace. Then I'm going to assume that that's not what he means. Okay, so he's quoting 1 Corinthians chapter eight. In this chapter, I love this chapter because it's talking about food that's sacrificed to idols and whether it's good enough, if it's okay, to still eat that? Is it going to stumble somebody? And Paul breaks it down beautifully. Paul's talking about food sacrifice to idols. He's not talking about scriptural knowledge. However, I will give Bill Johnson some grace here because this is something that I actually, um, I see a lot myself in the Christian community where people really are full of head knowledge, but they have like no love, very little love to go along with that knowledge. So what they know and how they act contradict each other, that I can understand. But contextually speaking, he's talking about having knowledge and then you know not acting in wisdom with that knowledge. So in this case, food sacrifice to idols. So knowledge is knowing you can eat the food sacrifice to idols. It's not a sin to do that. It's just an idol and you're not sinning. Wisdom is not eating it because that would mean that you could potentially stumble somebody else. So knowledge and love can make us grow in some way. The difference is, is that puffs up is like a bubble and, you know, edifying is like a building. One builds you up and the other puffs you up. So basically it boils down to pride, but to use this in this kind of context, I think it's a little much to discard biblical reading and biblical knowledge. Uh, by using this passage. See, and, and this is why <laughs> proper hermeneutics and exegesis is needed. Good theological Bible study, because if you understood what that passage meant, that, I mean, you, you couldn't really use it in the context in which Bill Johnson's using it in. Uh, this is one reason why I, I think that a lot of New Age practices are finding their home at Bethel, is because experience and power is put before scripture. I think that there are secondary issues that can be discussed, but it's pretty clear, you know, that there's some foundational things within scripture that we can't really mess with. Okay, um, chapter nine, the works of the father. There's actually not much to add here, in my opinion. Uh, but one thing in this chapter that I did want to point out, because I think it's necessary to understand uh, certain positions that they hold with associating with other people. On page 103, he's talking about res rediscovering purpose, which is talking about, you know, the original purpose that God had for mankind. There's an excerpt here about associations. He talks about King David, you know, how he was known for killing Goliath in his youth, and that there was at least four other giants killed in scripture, all killed by men who followed David, the giant killer. Um, and he's saying that it basically rubs off on you. So who you associate with rubs off on you. If you hang around an evangelist, you will think evangelistically. The same happens when we associate with those who regularly experience signs and wonders in their lives. So uh, again, I, I see this a lot in other religions. Who you associate with affects your thinking. So if you're told to think and be in a certain mindset, you want to be around other people who agree with that mindset. So in a way, there's 
nothing wrong with that. I mean, if, if you have children, you want them to hang around people who are making good choices. I mean, I understand that aspect, but that's not what he's saying here. He's basically saying that if you want an anointing, being around anointed people is where you need to be. If you want anointing, don't hang out with people that are not anointed. Don't read their books. Don't uh, talk to them. Don't, you know, have anything, don't have much to do with them. Don't associate with them if you want this. And I see that a lot in control groups. And this is one way that your thinking can kind of be controlled. So on to chapter 10, powerlessness, unnecessary and unbalanced is the name of the chapter. Uh, this is where he's talking about basically how some people can choose character over power. On page 108, it says this, character is shaped through obedience. Jesus commanded his disciples to go and in going, they were to teach all that they had been taught. And part of what they were taught was specific training on how to live and operate in the miraculous. They were commanded to heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, and cast out demons. And now they were responsible to teach this requirement as a lifestyle for all who were to become followers of Jesus Christ. In this way, his standard could remain the standard, the norm for all who call upon the name of the Lord for salvation. I don't understand how this is a requirement. It gets, it gets to the point where it's not just the simple gospel anymore. There, there's more to this. I mean, we have seen, I've read time and time again, where, where he basically says that how you tell it's legit is by a God encounter. On page 112, he's talking about pursuing an encounter. At some point, we must believe in a God who is big enough to keep us safe in our quest for more of him. Practically speaking, many Christians, devil is bigger than their God. Further down, he says, so how do we walk in the power of God? First, we must pursue him. The life of power is a life of abiding in Christ, staying plugged into our power source. So Christ is a power source. The hunger for the demonstration of power must not be separated from our passion for him, but realize this, our hunger for him in part must be seen in our lustful pursuit of spiritual gifts. That is his command. I don't understand how he gets to that conclusion. You notice he says it's a lustful pursuit for spiritual gifts. Fill in the blank with this, your lustful pursuit for Jesus alone. I mean, every time, the more I'm reading this, it's almost like it's just, they want more, 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 more. It's like, they're not satisfied. I mean, I, I guess I just don't understand this logic. I mean, if you're, if you're constantly on this quest for the supernatural and for experiences, this type of belief system will leave you empty in the end. It's exhausting and it's not maintainable long-term. Time is the biggest tattletale. Either you lose your faith or you leave. I mean, it's like, as I said before, if you don't have enough spiritual experiences or you don't speak in tongues or you don't get your healing, you're going through some sort of suffering or whatever it is, whenever those trials do come, whenever those questions come and you don't have a foundation for how to handle it, you kind of crumble. And theologically speaking, Bill Johnson kind of lives in a fantasy world in this sense. Your foundation should be in scripture because that really tells you who Jesus is and who the Holy Spirit is and how he functions. The reality that I'm seeing here in, in this book just doesn't match up with scripture. He wants power, signs, miracles, and wonders, uh, revival, basically, even if it means going outside of scripture to get it. I see that it's not happening. So what he's doing is that he's making it happen. Kind of like my jet ski analogy earlier. You need to be in a kingdom mindset and don't derail from this because if you do, you could lose your anointing. Now to kind of bounce off of that, I'm going to read this from page 115. It's under look for fruit. Be childlike and read the works of those who have succeeded in the healing ministry. Stay away from the books and tapes of those who say it shouldn't or can't be done. If the author doesn't walk in power, don't listen, no matter how proficient they may be in another field, such as like biblical finances. Maintain respect for that individual's place in God and his or her idea of expertise, but never waste precious time reading the stuff of those who do not do what they teach. We have grown fat on the theories of classroom Christians. We must learn from those who just do it. Someone once brought a book to my office that was critical of the revival that started in Toronto of January, 1994. I refused to read it and threw it away. You might say, you're not very open-minded. You're right. I am responsible to protect what God has given me. 
this is concerning to me. Do you see what he does? He's saying a critical analysis is it, to look at that and think about it is not godlike. It's not something that he wants to do. It's a mindset. To tell somebody to stay away from critical literature is a huge red flag to me. What are you trying to hide? If it's the truth, it should stand on its own. The truth will always stand on its own. Scripture speaks about this, ironically, that you can test what you believe. And this is why I'm convinced that this is one reason why Bill Johnson won't talk to people that are critical of his beliefs. Uh, doubts are not allowed because they hinder your power and your faith. Now, to his credit, I have heard Bill Johnson say that, you know, people that uh, he admires, you know, that may basically are in the same movement as he is, uh, his friends, uh, that he is open to hearing their criticisms. But if it were to be like, for example, somebody like me, I would sit down and really ask him so many questions. I, I don't think he'd be up for that. On page 116, he says, do not make excuses for powerlessness. For decades, the church has been guilty of creating doctrine just to justify their lack of power instead of crying out to God until he changed them. The lie they came to believe has given rise to an entire branch of theology that has infected the body of Christ with a fear of the Holy Spirit. It deceives under the guise of staying undeceived. The word must go forth with power. Power is the realm of the spirit. A powerless word is the letter, not the spirit. And we all know the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Okay. He's basically saying that studying the Bible will kill you spiritually. Second Corinthians chapter three, verse six, the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Context. Context is so important. In this verse, Paul is talking about people who reject Christ, but still have the law. So if you read the whole chapter, which I recommend, by the way, I mean, Greg Kokel, he always says, never read a Bible verse. I mean, you read 10 before, 10 after. Here, Paul in chapter three, it says in, ver in verse six, he has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit for the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. If you read before in verse two, you show that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. He's talking about the law. I mean, in verse three, he's clearly talking uh, about letters written on stone and, and that the law kills because it's written on stone. So to say that reading the Bible and Bible study is dangerous spiritually, see, and this is where I get kind of frustrated because it's, I, I do see him speaking out of both sides of his mouth. I mean, how can you say that the Bible is authoritative and then it's not at the same time, which obviously uh, the Bible is not authoritative over experience. It's not. So I think he's covering his tracks in that sense, you know, and I, I think that this paves the way for their signs and wonders movement, for their prophecies, for their healings, which is all set for the kingdom to come. And it's done through revival. Uh, the issue I have, one of the issues I have with this is that it creates an environment where this is not always authentic. I mean, you don't always have authentic experiences, healing, signs, wonders uh, in this mindset. But if you are always told to stay in this mindset, you're always going to see bead drops on your car. You know what I mean? I see this mostly as an adrenaline rush most of the time than an actual healing uh, do healings actually take place? Probably. I, I do think that God still can and does heal. Um, even through people that, you know, may not completely understand the process. But the, the issue is that say you, you do get a healing and then it goes away later. I mean, they can say that you lost your healing um, and then they can put the responsibility on you and your mindset. You don't have a kingdom now mindset. You lost your anointing, you lost your healing. And I think it's really interesting also that Bethel only allows positive prophecies, uh, which is really ironic to me because I, I see in scripture that it was the false prophets that always gave positive and encouraging prophecies. There's no negative uh, prophecies that are allowed to be given. Okay, moving on to chapter 11. The high cost of low power is the name of this one. Okay, he starts off by saying revival is the atmosphere in which Christ's power is most likely to be manifested. It touches every part of human life, breaking into society with sparks of revolution. Such glory is costly and it is not to be taken lightly. Nevertheless, a powerless church is far more costly in terms of human suffering and lost souls. 
And then down a little bit more, he says, let me illustrate the necessity of signs and wonders in our quest to see our cities transformed and the glory of God fill the earth. And then a little bit down more, he says, we are to be a witness for God. To give witness is to represent. Now, I want you guys to notice something really quick. Um, I want you to notice how quickly, I, I see this throughout this entire book, but how quickly he escalates things by taking one simple word or, you know, definition or whatever it is, and just kind of runs with it. To give witness is to represent. This actually means to represent him. Therefore, to represent him without power is a major shortcoming. It is impossible to give an adequate witness of God without demonstrating his supernatural power. The supernatural is his natural realm. Jesus was an exact representation of the Father's nature. His representation of the Father is to be a model for us as we learn how to represent him. So this is like, in my opinion, a faulty sort of logic. It's like he can take a subjective twist on a lot of things to get the results that he wants. In this case, he's using this word to kind of make a theological point. Okay, so I'm going to skip ahead to page 123. I wish I could read more, guys, but I already know that this video is going to be so long. <laughs> On page 123, under the supernatural is the key to the sin cities of the world, it says this, <clears throat> the anointing at Capernaum was so great that some translations say they were exalted to heaven. Could he be saying that the miracle realm around them was so great that it made their city the most like heaven of any city on the earth? If so, Capernaum became for a brief season an example of on earth as it is in heaven. They made room for his great work, but never made the adjustment in their lives to make it their main focus. Now, here's the thing. Speaking of, you know, making subjective theological statements, what most people do, if you trust Bill Johnson, you won't go back and read that scripture. You just see, oh, he quoted Matthew 11, verse 23. You, you just take it for what it is and, and not really go back and reference what he just quoted. Okay. He's saying the anointing in Capernaum was so great that some translations say they were exalted to heaven. I actually looked for this. I have never seen this in any translation, including their own, including the passion translation. This is what Matthew 11 verse 23 says, and you Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. So I'm, I'm reading what, what he's saying here. And he's saying, could, could he be saying that the miracle realm around them was so great and made their city like on heaven as it is on earth? No, he's condemning them. He's rebuking them. <laughs> I mean, this is why context is so important. This is why reading your Bible, and it's really simple. I, I, it was really simple to just read that and see what it said. So moving on later in the chapter, page 126 and 127, it says, every miracle testified of Jesus's identity. Without miracles, there can never be a full revelation of Jesus. And later down, he says, acts of power help people to tune their hearts to the things of God. It helps to break them loose from the rationale that this material world is the ultimate reality. Such a shift in perspective is essential to the most basic response to God. In essence, that is what the word repentance means. Miracles provide the grace for repentance. I'm going to go down another paragraph. Miracles cause a shift in priorities. They are an important aid in helping us to hear more clearly. Without them, we are more inclined to be directed by our own minds and call it spirituality. Again, he's taking another stab at critical thinking. I'm going to read one more section and then I will give my thoughts. So he's speaking about a scripture, Romans 15, verses uh, 18 through 19. Um, and then it says, Here, the Apostle Paul demonstrates how the Gentiles were brought into obedience through the power of the Spirit of God, expressed in signs and wonders. This was what he considered as fully preaching the gospel. It wasn't a complete message without a demonstration of the power of God. It's how God says amen to his own declared word. Okay, so do you see what he's doing here? The more that we're reading and the more that we're getting down to the gritty business, um, there's more to 
the gospel than just the simplicity of the gospel. He's doing the raisin bran thing again. He's taking these verses and, and leaving out the rest that there are many times in scripture where the gospel is presented without any signs and wonders. He's making a distinction between what the gospel is that we see in scripture and, and what he says the gospel is. If you're going to read any book in scripture about the gospel, it would be Romans. And I find it very interesting that he points to the one scripture that talks about signs and wonders and leaves out the rest talking about the gospel. In this scripture, in, in the context of it, he's talking about obedience. So what I see Bill Johnson doing is that he's reading into the text of something that's not there. Just because signs and wonders and miracles are in the same, you know, section as the gospel, it doesn't mean that that is the gospel. He's saying that they were present, but that's not part of the gospel message. And as I said before, there are certainly times that signs, wonders, and miracles, healings were presented, that were given, that happened, and obviously are talked about in scripture. But this was not every time the gospel was presented. Interestingly, we see this many times in scripture. I'll give a few examples because there's a lot, but um, interestingly, a lot of them are in the book of Acts. Uh, Acts 17 verses two through three. As his custom was, Paul went into the synagogue and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that the Christ had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I'm proclaiming to you is the Christ, he said. Some of the Jews were persuaded. And then if we go further down in chapter 17, verse 11, of course, we have the Bereans. Now, the Bereans were of more noble character than the Thessalonians, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul was said was true. Um, again, they believed because they checked the scriptures, not because he performed a sign or a wonder or a healing. There's more. Chapter 18, verse 4. Every Sabbath he reasoned in the synagogue trying to persuade the Jews and Greeks. Again, no sign or wonders. Why not just do a miracle or a trick? Why reason from the scriptures? Verse 28. For he vigorously refuted the Jews in public debate, proving from the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. Chapter 28, verse 24. From morning till evening, Paul explained and declared to them the kingdom of God and tried to convince them about Jesus from the law of Moses and from the prophets. Some are convinced by what he said, but others would not believe. They, I mean, the greatest commandment was to love God with all our souls, hearts, and minds. See, this is everywhere throughout scripture. Yes, signs and wonders were performed, but not all the time. Many times. In fact, I would dare to say most of the time, we see that the gospel was presented in a very simplistic way. You know, I mean, why reason with them? Why, why open up the scriptures and, and talk about things and... and have a good debate, you know, and use apologetics. If you can just, oh, what's that? Your arm's broken? Let me just come heal that for you and prove what I'm saying is true. Like, no, that didn't happen all the time. The disciples got sick. They were persecuted. Their view of the kingdom is different than what Johnson's saying. Uh, one example of this is in Galatians 4, and it's in verses 13 through 14. As you know, this is Paul talking, it was because of an illness that I first preached the gospel to you. Even though my illness was a trial to you, he did not treat me with contempt or scorn. Paul could not have his illness healed. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 20, uh, Paul has a final greeting to Timothy. And he's saying that he basically left a friend sick. You know, and then of course we have the classic Paul and the thorn in his side. Jesus said his grace was sufficient for Paul. My question is, is it sufficient for you? There's a lot more I could go into in this chapter. Um, but again, this is gonna be a crazy long video, I can tell. Page 129, reading the signs. Many fear signs and wonders because of the possibility of deception. So in order to prevent any opportunity of being deceived, they replace displays of power with religious traditions. Christian activities are even Bible study. They often become satisfied with knowledge. But when this happens, who is really deceived? It's just shocking to me to see how he continually implies that Bible study uh, is bad. He continues to say, we've gone as far as we can with our present understanding of scripture. It's time to let signs have their place. They illustrate scripture, all the while pointing to Jesus, the son of God. Yet they also confirm to a people who have embraced an authentic gospel that they are going in the right direction. So we can see clearly that there's a divide being made by what the gospel message is 
and what he's saying the gospel is. He kind of hits the nail on the head in this next chapter, chapter 12 our debt to the world, and encounter with God. He starts it out by saying the anointing of the Holy Spirit is his actual presence upon us for ministry. The purpose of the anointing is to make the supernatural natural. Now he goes into the anointing a little bit more. He calls it being smeared with God. He says anointing means smeared. And it's this God covering that gives us his power-filled presence and that supernatural things will happen when we walk in the anointing. So, and this is where he touches a little bit on impartation. He basically is saying that to keep your anointing, you need to give it away. On page 134, he says, we must remember in the kingdom of God, we only get to keep what we give away. This wonderful presence of God is to be taken to the world. If it isn't, our effectiveness decreases. Hey, you want a higher anointing? Well, you need to be giving it away more. I see this as giving an incentive to people who want to keep it and, and, and makes them fearful of losing it. He goes on to say on page 135 about, you know, the woman who touched his robe that was healed from bleeding, saying Jesus was anointed by the Holy Spirit. The actual power of the Spirit of God left his being and flowed into the woman and healed her. The anointing was resident in Jesus's physical body, the same as with every believer. The faith of that woman put a demand on that anointing in Jesus. She was healed because the anointing breaks the yoke. On page 136, it's, he says, I look forward to the day when the church stands up and says, don't believe us unless we're doing the works that Jesus did. The Bible says we are to pursue earnestly, lustfully spiritual gifts, and those gifts make us established. Which ones? All of them. The thing is, is that we're not doing these works. They're not doing these works of the Holy Spirit. What does that say about the church? You know, he's wanting these Bible sized miracles and it seems like they're being more forced and fabricated than they're actually authentically being experienced. I, I've established that I obviously believe that God does signs, wonders, visions, things like that, but that's completely in his control, which is a total foreign idea to somebody at Bethel. You know, I mean, shadows healing people, parting the Red Sea, raising the dead. These are extreme examples of the Holy Spirit, you know? And if we're gonna get extreme like that, um, Ananias and Sapphira are a good example of extremes. I mean, they lied to the Holy Spirit and they died for it. Bill Johnson wants to say that we're the same as Jesus, but Jesus healed 100% of the time. He never failed. And the thing is, is that he chose when and how to heal. And what I find very interesting is that he healed at his will, even people that didn't have faith to be healed. And we see this many times in scripture. We see it in Matthew chapter 8, verses 5 through 13. We see it in Mark chapter 1, verses 23 through 26. And we see it in chapter 9. We see it in Luke chapter 17. Uh, but thinking that God is in control in that aspect, just it doesn't come up in their mind. Here's kind of where I think he misses the forest for the trees. This is on page 137. The fullness of the spirit was the goal of God throughout the law and prophets. Salvation was the immediate goal, but the ultimate goal on earth was the fullness of the spirit in the believer. Getting us into heaven is not near as great as a challenge as it is to get heaven into us. So we can see that there's a disagreement there in, in what scripture says the reason why Jesus came. It's not to give us power, it's to save our souls. All right, I'm gonna read a few more things and then we'll move on to the next chapter. On page 138, it's on Jesus passed the baton. For us to become all that God intended, we must remember that Jesus's life was a model of what mankind could become if it were the right relationship with the Father. Through the shedding of his blood, it would be possible for everyone who believed on his name to do as he did and become as he was. This meant then that every true believer would have access to the realm of life that Jesus lived in. Jesus came as the light of the world and he passed the baton to us, announcing that we are the light of the world. Jesus came as the miracle worker. He said that we would do greater works than he did. Later on down, it says, what was the initial revelation of the house of God? It was the presence of God, a gate to heaven, and a ladder with angels ascending and descending upon it. Watch what he's implying. What I see that he's obviously implying is that Jesus passed the baton to us, and now we're the ladder from earth to heaven. And then he talks a little bit about angels. I, we talk about this in the Physics of Heaven video. Bill Johnson and many of the leaders believe that angels are here basically to render service to us, that they're here to kind of work together with us in the supernatural, uh, among other things. We do go into more detail in that in the Physics of Heaven video. I'm going to end this chapter on the last few sentences that he wrote here. It's been my pursuit of him that has led me to this passion for an authentic gospel. Check this out, guys. 
something happened in me that won't let me accept a gospel that isn't backed with signs and wonders. Is it because I have caught a revelation of miracles on earth? No, it caught me. I have discovered there isn't any lasting satisfaction in life apart from expressions of faith. Now remember his definition of faith, it's power. So I wanted to elaborate a little bit more on what Bill Johnson just said about that he couldn't believe in a gospel that didn't have signs and wonders backing it. Guys, this is really disturbing. (laughs) There's a difference between what he says the gospel is and what I see in scripture. The simplicity of the gospel is ripped away. It's now made to look like we need signs and wonders to have an authentic gospel. That is very concerning. And this is, again, one of those times that I wish I could just sit down with Bill Johnson and have a discussion with him about this and clarify this. I kind of just want everybody to think about this for just a second. By Bill Johnson's definition of an authentic gospel, I don't have the real gospel. And you probably don't either, according to him. I believe in miracles. I believe in healings, but not to the extent that he is saying we need to experience them in order to have a real gospel. I don't speak in tongues. I don't have these experiences that he's talking about in this book. So by that definition, what gospel does Bill Johnson say that I have? These are just some thoughts that I wanted to add before we move on to the next chapter. On to chapter 13, our identity in this world. He starts it off by saying, while most of the church is still trying to become as Jesus was, the Bible declares, as he is, so are we. So that sets the whole tone for the chapter. You know, and honestly, I can see why New Agers are attracted to these teachings, Uh, primarily new thought, something that I was into. I made a a video on the law of attraction not too long ago that it that connects uh, new thought leaders and the teachers of the signs and wonders movement together um, that we see in the NAR. So this chapter basically talks a lot about how we shouldn't talk about our weaknesses. We, We should not identify with our weaknesses, but we should declare the power we have. And it reminds me a lot of affirmations. On page 147, he says, it was easy to think that being constantly aware of my faults and weaknesses was humility. It's not. If I'm the main subject talking incessantly about my weaknesses, I have entered into the most subtle form of pride. Repeated phrases such as I'm so unworthy become a nauseating replacement for the declarations of the worthiness of God. Okay, so here's the thing. Uh, Paul would disagree with this. One of the biggest pieces of advice I will give people that are watching that might have a critical eye to this, it's going to be very simple, but read through the entire New Testament. (laughs) Corinthians and Romans are a great start, in my opinion, because when you read something like that out of Bill Johnson's book, the first thing that came to my mind is Second Corinthians, because Paul is literally boasting about his weakness, boasting about his suffering. In Second Corinthians chapter 11, basically half of the chapter is devoted to him talking about his weakness. And he's boasting in his weakness. This is not an invitation to be, you know, down on ourselves or put ourselves down or anything like that. That's not what Paul is saying. What he's saying is that it's in our weakness that he makes us strong. It's not giving you a license to basically talk bad about yourself. That's not, you know, what I think even Bill Johnson is saying. I think Bill Johnson is saying that we shouldn't talk about our weaknesses because then they limit us, which I just, I don't think that's correct. I think there's a Uh, a better way to look at that, scripturally speaking. I mean, it makes you wonder why Bill Johnson wants you to stay away from the Bible. I mean, it doesn't take a deep thinker to understand and know why. If you're being barred from scripture, you can say things like this then. There's not much I want to elaborate on in chapter 14, so I'm going to go to chapter 15. How to miss a revival. He starts it out by saying, revival is centered to the message of the kingdom, for it is in revival that we more clearly see what his dominion looks like and how it is to affect society. Revival at its best is thy kingdom come. In a way, revival illustrates the normal Christian life. In this chapter, you know, he's talking about how people miss a revival. (laughs) On page 160, he touches on more of what I call an us versus them mentality between religious people and, you know, people in his camp and how he kind of feels like they can be misunderstood. It says, therefore, Jesus suffered outside the gate. Therefore, let us go forth to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. 
Revival usually takes us outside the camp, the religious community. That is often where he is, outside the camp. On page 162 and 163, he's talking about what happened in Acts 2, you know, the outpouring of the Spirit and Joel. And he's saying that none of those things mentioned by Joel, it like was half completed. And he's saying that the very fact that this seems like an improper interpretation of scripture should reveal to us that it is we who often approach his book incorrectly. The Bible is not a book of lists that confine or corral God. The word does not contain God. It reveals him. And then he talks about, you know, how people are basically turned off by the gifts of the spirit. In this paragraph, he says that it's taught against them and that many of these same individuals warm up to such things when they face an impossible situation and need the help of someone experienced in the gospel of power. See, this isn't not in my case. I don't know how they can say these things yet act the way that they do sometimes. It's kind of crazy to go to a service at Bethel and see everybody kind of just all over the floor and everybody speaking in tongues. There are rules to this. In, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, there are rules for how you should conduct a service in control. He elaborates more again on the kingdom now theology, the revival. Jesus can only return to a world that reflects the kingdom of God in their eschatology. This is why they're so adamant about power and faith and preaching a gospel of signs and wonders. This must be done for Jesus to return. They literally want to take over the world. They want to usher in this kingdom, this new mindset, this revival. And I have to say, uh, again, the parallel is uncanny. I mean, you have the new age, which literally means bringing in a new age of consciousness. It's, it's a belief that new agers have that, you know, will bring in a cosmic shift of consciousness that has to happen for mankind to redeem the earth from its unenlightened state. This might also be a good time to briefly bring up what is called the seven mountain mandate. Now, now basically what this is, is that in order for Christ to return, the church must take over the seven main spheres of influence in the world right now. And if you don't believe me that this is what they teach, Bill Johnson literally wrote a book about this. The seven areas of society that they're trying to influence and take over, education, religion, of course, family, business, government and military, arts and entertainment, and media. So in these ways, this is how they're going to take dominion of the earth. Okay, we're going to move on to the last chapter, chapter 17, this present revival. He starts it by saying, what God has planned for the church in this hour is greater than our ability to imagine and pray. We must have the help of the Holy Spirit to learn about these mysteries of the church and God's kingdom. Without him, we don't have enough insight even to know what to ask for in prayer. So in this chapter, he talks again more about the kingdom. And he's talking about how Jesus, you know, he's glorified right now. And that's our model for what we are to become. And he's leading people into, you know, wanting more of the spirit, more encounters. On page 179, he says, because many fear excess, mediocrity is embraced as balance. Such fear takes complacency a virtue. And it's the fear of excess that has made those that are resistant to change appear noble minded. Then he says, down below a little bit more, divisions occur whenever the intellect is enthroned as the measure of spirituality, not because spiritual gifts are exercised as many charge. I pay no attention to the warnings of possible excess from those who are satisfied with lack. And this is just more reasons to shed his mind to opposition. On page 180, I kind of want to read this and point this out. He says, the wisdom of God will again be seen in his people. The church, which is presently despised or at best ignored, will again be reverenced and admired. The church will again be a praise in the earth. What gets me is that he's quoting uh, uh, Jeremiah 33 verse 9. Uh, it does not talk about the church. Um, it didn't exist yet. And again, what bothers me is that people reading this will just take his word for it. They, don't, they, they won't go read Jeremiah chapter 33. If you read the whole chapter, it's very obviously talking about Israel. He continues to talk about you know, the return of Christ. He'll return for the spotless one when he views our obedience as complete. And I'm going to read a few more things, then I'll give some comments. On page 185, they talk a lot about, you know, doing greater works than Jesus did. He who believes in me, the works that I do will do also, and greater works than these he will do. Okay, so this is what he says. Greater means greater, and the works he refer to are signs and wonders. It will not be a disservice to him to have a generation obey him and go beyond his own watermark. This verse is often explained away by saying 
<clears throat> it refers to quantity of works, not quality. As you can see, millions of people should be able to surpass the sheer number of works that Jesus did simply because there are so many. But that waters down the intent of his statement. Now he tries to do a, a little word uh, dissection here. The word greater is myzon in the Greek. It is found 45 times in the New Testament. It is always used to describe quality, not quantity. <clears throat> Here's the thing, two things. First, nobody is doing greater works, not even close to what Jesus did. So could it be that he meant something else? Number two, this is you know where being an intellect comes in handy. I did look up the, the definition of this word and I, I couldn't find uh, that it didn't mean a numerical value. It very clearly was talking about quantity. So the word that he's talking about, maison, is it literally means large, great, and abundant. It's talking about quantity. All right, I'm going to read this last excerpt, and then I'm going to give my conclusions of this book. Page 186 and 187. We are the most to be pitied if we think we've reached the fullness of what God intended for his church here on earth. All church history is built on partial revelation. Everything that has happened in the church over the past uh, 1900 years has fallen short of what the early church had and lost. Each move of God has been followed by another just to restore what was forfeited and forgotten, and we still haven't arrived to the standard that they attained, let alone surpassed it. No kidding. Yet not even the early church fulfilled God's full intention for his people. You hear that? Not even the apostles got it right. That privilege was reserved for those in the last leg of the race. That is our destiny. As wonderful as our spiritual roots are, they are insufficient. To insist that we stay with what our fathers fought for is to insult our forefathers. They risked all to pursue something fresh and new in God. They risked everything for the gospel, not, not for power. Uh, moving down a little bit on page 187. As we pursue the extravagant one with reckless abandon, we will discover that our greatest problem is the resistance that comes from between our ears. He says this many times in the book. <clears throat> our thinking. But faith is superior. Faith is power, remember? And it's time for us to make him unconcerned about whether or not he'll find faith on the earth. The kingdom is in the now. So where do we go from here? Guys, there's lots to say. Oh my goodness. That took a lot of work to go through this book. Here are my conclusions. Now, not everybody's going to agree with me on where I'm at with this, but I just gave a lot of uh, backup for where Bill Johnson stands. Again, everything that is happening in the signs and wonders movement, again, has to do with their eschatology, kingdom now. And they're trying to make a sort of fantasy uto utopia like signs and wonders world for him to return i, I think some people call this an overrealized eschatology they basically believe that what is supposed to be given to us in the resurrection is given to us in the present it, it's like a weird version of dominion theology where it basically says that man needs to fix the earth in order for jesus to return and somehow god has lost control of this and he needs man's help to get things back on track with this movement as a whole um what this reminds me of is what I call the honeymoon phase in any new relationship. Uh, I also call this being Twitter pated. Some of you people will get that reference. Some people won't. Think Bambi and Friend Owl and anyway, it just you're Twitter pated. You're you're in the honeymoon phase. Just everything seems perfect and amazing and it feels good. It feels amazing in the beginning of a brand new relationship. It, it's kind of like if when you first come to Christ you feel that, like you feel in love, you feel good, you feel uh, great. And it's almost like with some people in like a toxic relationship, it's like they break up just to make up, just to get that feeling back uh, that kind of faded. I kind of see this as a weird parallel to what they're doing. They, they're, they're chasing after the honeymoon feeling. They're chasing after that, that loving feeling that fades after a while. God's not always going to give us feelings and emotion to validate our relationship. I do see this more as a social movement than a spiritual one. I do not see this as a sustainable belief system. Uh, they keep talking about revivals failing. Maybe there's a reason for that. Without a foundation for truth, uh, it will crumble. I, I don't see any reason to think that the apostles failed at what they did. 
at all. This appeals to your emotions, not your God-given intellect. It sacrifices good theology and hermeneutics on the altar of experience and feelings. Uh, here's what I see are the dangers of this movement. People are attracted to the supernatural rather than conforming to what Jesus taught in scripture. In fact, they're taught and told that Bible study will mess with your anointing and your experience. I said it before and I'll say it again. <laughs> if Jesus was all you had, if Jesus was all Bill Johnson had, no experience, no power, no anointing, no supernatural experiences, no encounters, would that be enough? According to Bill Johnson, no. In fact, according to Bill Johnson, that's not even the full gospel. So if you don't have the gospel and you don't have it backed with signs and wonders, what does that say according to his theology? Now, I'm, I'm going to go on record by saying this. Again, I believe that there are actually many people at Bethel that disagree with this. They don't agree that that's the gospel. My critique is specific to this book and it's specific to Bill Johnson's theology. Bill Johnson, the leader of Bethel. I mentioned this in uh, the Physics of Heaven video, but if you're told that you can have the supernatural and hear straight from God yourself, then, you know, who needs this dusty old thing? In 2 Timothy 4.3, it says, For a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. Some people don't want to know the truth. Some people are really satisfied with thinking these teachings are true which is one reason why I think somebody like Bill Johnson is so popular. Um, and this is also one reason why I think they're opening the door to entering the new age. I think they're frustrated. I think that they're not seeing what they are wanting to see. If they're supposed to do greater works than Jesus, that's not happening, not even close. But the new age, hmm, they're onto something. So that's what I'm seeing is happening here. They're, they're trying to basically say, oh, well, we're not having this revival because the devil stole it from us in the form of the new age. So to them, to take dominion, I mean, I hope you see what I'm getting at here. To take dominion means to go enter into the new age and take back what was taken from them in order to get their revival so Jesus can come back. Okay, and with scripture, I'm astounded at Bill Johnson's view of scripture. I don't get the reason to downplay the study of the Bible unless they're teaching or doing something that contradicts it. We're never taught in scripture to give up critical thinking. We're never taught in scripture that to obtain the power of the Holy Spirit, that you should elevate the supernatural experience over the word of God. And I, I mentioned earlier the irony that the Holy Spirit, this is the only thing the Holy Spirit wrote. The Holy Spirit wrote the Bible. See, and what happens is, is that they'll take, you know, verses here and there, you know, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, where the person without the Spirit uh, doesn't accept the things of the Spirit, you know, but that's talking about unbelievers. I want to point out now that there are many scriptures that are misused in the signs and wonders movement, in new thought, uh, in word of faith theology, me and my friend, Mike Winger, made a video about this, actually, specifically. I made a Law of Attraction video talking about how the Word of Faith is steeped in new thought practices, and we went through, I think it was about 15 scriptures, uh, uh, discussing them, talking about how they're misused and what they actually mean. Uh, I will put a link to that video in the description of this video so you can check it out. It is very relevant to this conversation, and it's very important to understand what these scriptures mean in their context. But anyway, with him disregarding scripture, this leaves room for subjective experience. And let me give you another example of this. It's equivalent to somebody in the new age saying that Jesus himself had visited them and gave them information that told them things, that, that Jesus was physically there, gave them visions, gave them some sort of spiritual experience. Uh, I, I mean, literally entire books have been written on this. And the Passion Translation, which we'll get to in a second, uh, is a result of a spiritual experience just like that. Their logic is that Jesus can't lie, so this must be Jesus. In fact, this Jesus healed them of their physical ailment, their sickness. In this case, scripture is not the authority their experiences. Now, if you compare this to how they teach about the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit led them to a revelation, a prophecy or something like that. It led to a healing of an ailment. The Holy Spirit can't lie and, and God wouldn't lead his children into deception. So this must be the Holy Spirit. The New Ager can say that their experience was valid. 
um, and also call themselves a Christian at the same time because she's taught that the Bible is secondary and they actually can and do use scripture to back up their beliefs as well. New Agers do that all the time. This is what happens when we elevate experience over scripture. This is called eisegesis. It's where you take a subjective view. You already have your mind made up and that's how you're going to approach scripture not taking scripture for what it is, and then going from there. I, I mean, you would think that there would have to be something that would tell the difference between what's real and what's not. That would be scripture. <laughs> Another thing is in Ephesians 6, uh, Paul's talking about the armor of God, and he's talking about the sword of the spirit being the word of God. What I'm seeing the leaders at Bethel do is they're basically taking the only spiritual weapon they have and turning it into a twig. <laughs> Nobody needs the sword. Let's just, you know, go into battle without it, you know, or let's replace it with something. We think it's inferior to what's actually happening. So let's pick up the stick and go into battle with that. That's basically what I'm seeing. The Bible is demoted and spiritually speaking, this leaves them vulnerable. If you're being taught these things that the Bible is secondary to your experience, you are being deceived. This is leaving you spiritually vulnerable to deception. Jesus, Paul, and the apostles had a high view of critical thinking and the scriptures. They also did do signs, wonders, and miracles and healings. But this was not supposed to be a stand-in for scripture. They contextually go hand in hand. The other thing is throughout reading this entire book, I never saw the gospel presented. I wish that I had seen that. Um, I saw his gospel <laughs> I saw a gospel presented about, you know, signs and wonders, but I did not see a gospel presented uh, that could save your soul. Now, I'm going to be very careful with how I say this uh, next thought, but scripture does speak of another Jesus and another gospel, but it also speaks of another spirit. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 4, you happily put up with whatever anyone tells you, even if they preach a different Jesus than the one we preach or a different kind of spirit than the one you received, or a different kind of gospel than the one you believed. And I find it interesting that Paul's writing to the Corinthians, <laughs> the ones that he rebuked harshly for abusing the spiritual gifts. Dare I say that I see a different spirit being described by Johnson than what I see in scripture, and a different gospel. I, I have to say, I really went on a little quest uh, this year to kind of really pin down and understand does Bill Johnson really preach a different gospel? Nah. Do we really need to fight this? Is this a hill I want to die on? You know, do I have a dog in this fight? Bill Johnson's gospel that he's preaching at Bethel, that he's teaching through his books, um, is a Jesus plus mentality that I am seeing. And it's very concerning because if you have the gospel without signs and wonders, according to him, is that really the gospel? It's no wonder that scripture is demoted in this sense. He focuses on supernatural encounters, miracle signs, everything in the supernatural, but the spirit, the Holy Spirit that we see in scripture doesn't just do those things. Obviously, I believe that the Holy Spirit works that way, but according to scripture itself, there's many ways that the Holy Spirit is authenticated. That is not the main goal of the Holy Spirit. Acts 4.31 says to speak the word of God boldly. The Holy Spirit should point you towards the Bible. It should point you towards scripture. You should have a hunger to want to read the word, not into power hungry experiences. Bill Johnson calls into question the very transparency of scripture and basically says that God is unknowable without some sort of mystical experience. And also I'd kind of like to wrap up a little bit on the passion translation. You know, I mean, if you want a power filled Bible, the one you got ain't cutting it for you. Just go get a passion translation. <laughs> Guys, this is such a muddle translation. I, I cannot tell you. I, I mentioned this before, but Brian Simmons was the one who made the passion translation. And what happened is that he said that Jesus came to him and asked him to do this assignment. He said that he would give him secret knowledge of the Hebrew language to do this. He said that Jesus breathed on him and would give him the secrets that he needed to make this translation. Okay, 2009. Brian Simmons gets a new assignment. What happened? Jesus Christ came into my room. He breathed on me and he commissioned me. What, when he breathed on you, I have to ask you this. What did it feel like? It felt like a kiss from heaven. 
it felt like heaven's wind, the ruach, the breath, the wind of God that came upon me. And he spoke to me and said, and I'm commissioning you to translate, to translate the, Bible the Bible into the into translation, the, project, the translation that project that I'm giving you to do. And, I and he promised that he would help me. And he promised me he would give me secrets language. of the Hebrew language. Do you believe when he blew on you there was an impartation for revelation? I do. I believe the spirit of revelation was given. And, and I, I have to say, when he breathed on me, in no way would I want to compare that to the uh, writers of the New Testament, the original mm -hmm. writers, uh, you know, Moses and the Torah and Ezekiel. Uh, he breathed on me so that I would do the project, and, and I felt downloads coming instantly. I received downloads. It was like I got a chip put inside of me. I got a connection inside of me to hear him better, to understand the scriptures better, and hopefully to translate. Are you finding that when people read uh, the translation you're working on, that it almost does a mind bypass and goes directly into the heart? I think that's a brilliant way to say it. The poetic language of Hebrew and Aramaic release something inside of us. It, it's, it's divine. It is full of revelation. There's flavor. It, it's, not, it's like thinking with your heart. It's like heart level to heart level, spirit to spirit, deep calling out to deep. Passion is the operative word. This translation will give you that passion back. He's also claimed to have these incredible supernatural experiences, one where he says that he was taken up to heaven and he was uh, in this huge library, and God told him he can only take two books. And he's looking around, and he wanted to take this third one. He wanted it so badly, he wasn't allowed to take it, but then God told him, oh, you're not ready for this yet, but someday I will bring you back and give you this book. And the book was John 22. It makes you wonder um, if he's going to add a chapter of the Bible. <laughs> Uh, to his passion translation. Okay, how in the world did you get into the library room of heaven? I want to go there. <laughs> well, I was actually asleep, and I was taken out of my body, and I was brought into this immense library room. I loved being there, and the Lord came up to me, and he said, Brian, I have brought you here, brought you here to let you take any two books you want. You want. And I'm just walking around, but it didn't take long before I saw a book that I knew I was to have. And then soon I saw another book I knew I was to have. But uh, you'll never want me back on the show when I tell you what happened then. What? Well, I have to tell you the truth. I saw a third book, and I knew the Lord told me I could only take two. And in heaven, whatever you think is put out over the loudspeaker. Everyone hears it. <laughs> Your thoughts are broadcasted. So here's what I hear coming out of the loudspeaker, and it's my own thoughts. How can I steal this book? <laughs> and then I said, oh, no, I'm shoplifting on God. I, I felt so ashamed. that I, But I knew if I could take this book, there was this book so, if I could just take this book back with me to the natural realm, it would trigger awakening in all the nations of the earth. It would bring the, it would make the name of Jesus famous on the, in the world. But Jesus came to me and said, Brian, I cannot let you take this book. I can't let and he you looked take at me in the book. eyes with love that You're melted me. And he said, book. you are not ready for that book. Then he promised but I will bring you back one day, and I, will give you and I will give you that book. What was the title? Written on the cover of the book was John 22. Uh, but there's only 21 chapters in John. What's this 22? Well, John 22, go back to John 14, 12, and you'll see that there is a greater works generation. The works that I do, you will do even greater works than these. I believe the John 22 generation will be a people that do the greater works of Jesus. They will not add to the scripture. They will not add to the scripture. Okay, everybody, I cannot get through this without pointing this out. Notice how he's saying they won't add to the scriptures while talking about 
adding to the scriptures. This is speaking out of both sides of his mouth. And, and that's a sealed book, but it is a book that is unfolding, and the works of Jesus will be replicated by an entire generation of people that believe fully in the power of God. So I wanted to add this in the video whenever I originally recorded it, but I thought about it, I, I left it out, but after doing all the editing, I decided, you know what, no, I'm going to make a comment about this. I'm going to uh, just kind of flat out say this. I started the video out talking about my eschatology. I still don't know where I stand. I'm still kind of rather undecided about that, but I know what I don't agree with, and it's the view that Bethel has about Jesus returning. I have made a case where they stand in their eschatology, and I've also explained why I disagree with it. One thing is for sure, a lot of Christians agree that Jesus is going to return. And depending on your eschatology, I've always said that if there were ever to be an infiltration of the church to make way for a false Christ, like an antichrist or somebody to display miraculous signs and wonders, and if there was a way for them to take charge, I always said that they would do it through the new age. And I've always thought that they would do it through the church. So if you think about it, New Age entering Bethel and Bethel embracing the New Age in a way is setting the stage for the master of deception to come through. Guys, they're not just doing this at Bethel. They want to do this at every church. They teach these things at Bethel and then they tell their students at BSSM and people that go to Bethel to take these teachings and go take them to other churches. This does create a lot of division, but this is why we see a lot of churches splitting and disagreeing with Bethel. This is not getting any smaller. This is going to get bigger. If I were the devil and I wanted to infiltrate the church, I would do it through the New Age. And I would do it through signs, wonders, and miracles. Second Thessalonians is a great read. It talks about the return of Christ. There is a particular passage that always stuck out to me, and it's in Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Verse 9, the coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with how Satan works. He will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie and all the ways that wickedness deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie. So again, it doesn't really matter where you stand on your eschatology. All I know is if there were somebody to come back and deceive the church... They would not do it through sound teaching. They would not do it through the scriptures. They would do it through signs, wonders, and miracles. So I have to admit, I've never seen anything like this before. I've never seen a church openly welcome New Age practices, thinking that they have to somehow redeem them. I think that this is a huge mistake that Bethel is making. If anything, they're setting up the entire church for deception. And I plead with them to look at these teachings and to really examine the scriptures, prayerfully examine them. And please consider the things that were talked about in this video. And please consider why the leaders at Bethel don't want you to get into your Bible too much. So guys, I, I just want to say thank you for hanging with me. This took a lot of work to do. It took a lot of time to do. I hope that this edifies you. I hope that this has helped you. I hope that it opens eyes uh, and makes clear um, for people who wonder why there's an issue at Bethel, uh, why there is, is, you know, people talking about this, why people are speaking out. I hope that I did this in a loving way. I, I do love Bill Johnson. I, I would, I would love to talk to him and, and have, you know, a conversation about these teachings, maybe clarify some things. He's a person too, guys. Okay. And they all need our prayers. If, there's ever an opportunity to be loving and, and give the gospel to them, do that. Going up to him and kind of just treating him with disdain, I just don't think that's the proper way to go. I think that there's a better way to deal with this. Um, as I said before, I have a lot of love for the leaders at Bethel. I don't have any animosity towards him. I, I disagree with him a lot, but I just want you guys to know that we need to be praying for him. I'm going to leave links in the description of this video to a lot of things that I talked about here in this video, as many resources as I can to help edify you and serve you. Thanks again so much for watching. God bless you.